morning. We have a very spicy hearing today. We have our returning familiar faces. We have Harpootlian. We have Jim Griffin. We have Mr. Barber over there. These are legal representatives of Alex Murdoch. He's behind back there. You can see him in the orange jumpsuit. We're also going to have Creighton Waters as well, who was a solicitor for the murder trial. And Judge Newman is there as well. Um, we're going to see Corey Fleming. And I haven't seen Russell Lafitte yet because, you know, I jumped in different parts of this uh, hearing. But I'm sure Russell Lafitte will make an appearance as well. So this is for the Murdoch financial crimes uh, hearing. And we're doing a status hearing for Murdoch and I think Russell Lafitte. However, there will be a sentencing today for Corey Fleming. And so... In the beginning, the audio is a little bit, it's not the greatest, but they do fix the audio after break and the audio is exceptional for then on out. But we're going to start from the very beginning today. This is happening right now in the morning and uh, I hope you guys are doing well. <laughs> I am ready. Finally, I'm home at the right time. Hello, hello. Yeah, I'm honestly just going to jump right into it. Um, I'm going to have it like slightly sped up depending on who talks. Um, Creighton talks pretty fast, so I think we might keep him at normal speed. Harpootlian, I might speed him up a little bit. But um, Harpoolian and Murdoch's lawyers are going to speak first, and Harpoolian's going to be the, I guess, the representative of all of them right now. However, um, they're going to argue with Judge Newman about, you know, where the financial, the state financial crimes are going to take place, I guess. Uh, Harpoolian's like, well, where can we find a jury from Mars? And then Cliff, uh, Judge Newman's like, well, there's other counties, da 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 da. And then surprisingly, um, Harpoolian brings up the impropriety. That was uh, that he accused the impropriety of um, the court of clerks. So that's brought up as well in the very beginning of this hearing. So we're going to listen to this part right here. And if you're a little bit confused, what's going on with the Murdoch stuff? It's okay. There's a lot of crimes that he's being charged with. Um, we've already had the murder trial. That's already done with. He waived his right to a speedy trial. So that way, that's why it happened pretty quickly. Um, he was found guilty for the two counts of murder for his son and his wife, Maggie. And he's also had the financial crimes that are pending. Um, he's supposed to plead guilty for it. I think next week or sometime this month, but we're in court right now for, these are for the state financial crimes, the ones that he committed with his co-conspirators. So that's why there's just so much going on with the Murdoch stuff right now. And then also we're waiting to hear the decision about whether or not there's going to be another extra steps taken to investigate uh, Rebecca Hill, who was the court of clerk during the murder trial, because the attorneys for Alex Murdoch, they alleged that she engaged in, some really bad jury tampering. So we got a lot going on with the Murdoch stuff, but we're going to start with today's hearing. And if you guys have any questions, just feel free to ask them in the chat. I'll be happy to try to answer them for you. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Jane. Hi, Chantal. And yeah, I know today's an early stream. So good morning. <laughs> um, I'll try to have some notes on the stream if case, you know, just in case if like uh, people are confused about anything. Or maybe I'll do like some stream elements command. But let's start with... Usually I like watching the morning stuff. I kind of like seeing like all the people coming in to the court, you know, one by one, kind of like chattering with each other, saying good morning. But, um, oh, I think it's like an hour's worth of that. So I'm just going to skip to the part where I think we're going to start with Creighton Waters. Yeah, there's Creighton Waters right there. And I do, and I, the audio is a little bit meh, but I'll try to adjust it as I go. And um, they do fix the audio at some point. Hold on a second. Yes. Sorry, it's my my little corgi here. He likes to earthquake the camera. <laughs> there he goes again. Hi, Fire. Hi, Coop and Whiskey. How are you doing today? I need to change my setup or something. All right, bear with me for the audio. Twenty twenty one GS forty seven thirty three in Hampton County, also indicted in December twenty one. Twenty twenty one GS forty seven thirty four in Hampton County, also indicted in December twenty one. Twenty twenty one GS forty seven thirty five in Beaufort County, indicted in December twenty one. Twenty twenty one GS forty seven thirty six in Hampton County, also indicted in December twenty one. Twenty twenty one GS forty seven thirty seven in Hampton County, indicted of state grand jury in December. Yeah, 21. he does look like he's lost weight. Twenty twenty one GS forty seven thirty eight in Carlton County, that's indicted in December twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one GS forty seven twenty nine was a superseding uh, in Allendale County in January twenty twenty two. Yeah, and this is actually the first time we've seen Alex Murdoch in court. Apparently, he tried to, um, I guess, waive his appearance to be in court today, but the judgment was like, nope, you got to make a physical appearance. 22 GS 4701 in Hampton County in January of 2022. 2022 GS 4702 in Hampton County, that's January 22 was when it was indicted. 
2022 GS4703 in Allendale County in January of 22. 2021 GS4727 superseding uh, in March of 22 in Arnford County. 2021 GS4730 superseding uh, in Beaufort County in March of 2022. 2022 GS4701 in Hampton County in April. 2022 GS4702 in Hampton County in April. 2022 GS4703 is superseding in Allendale County in April of 2022. Okay, I pinned the message for you guys. 2022 GS4710 in Carlton County in June of 2022. 2022 GS4723 in Hampton County in August of 2022. 22 GS4724 in Carlton County in August of 2022. Uh, finally, our last two, 2022 GS4734 in Hampton in December of 2022. And 2023 GS4703 in Carlton County indicted in April of 23. Uh, Your Honor, the state grand jury indictments uh, that I've just listed uh, against uh, Alvin Murdoch represent 101 total charges. Jeez, over 101 total charges. Those are grand, uh, what's he say? Grand state jury um, indictments. For an alleged loss of eight point, uh, almost eight point eight million dollars. Uh, Your Honor, the state is here, as, as we have discussed and discussed, I believe, back in April, uh, requesting a trial date for Mr. Murdoch. Uh, I believe that uh, we look at uh, some of the other, uh, the other COVID conspirators that Floyd Fleming has pled. was supposed to go to trial this week. Um, but Mr. Murdoch uh, remains the state's priority, and I believe the case that is the priority would be the case involving uh, the Satterfield, Your Honor. Uh, that by far represents the greatest single loss among all the victims. Uh, that would be 2021 GS4730, being here in Beaufort County. Uh, and the state uh, uh, is intent and request of the court to uh, schedule a trial date as soon as uh, it's reasonably possible, uh, sometime in, before uh, the end of this year. Uh, to try uh, Alex Murdoch on those particular charges. All right, Mr. Oh, man, I don't know. I saw a little smirk with Alex Murdoch there. So Creighton Waters wants to have these trial, or sorry, this trial to start by the end of this year. Oh, my God, it's September. <laughs> oh, boy. Let's see what Harpootlian says. So, again, these um, state financial crimes are going to be the ones that includes um, the involvement with him, Russell Lafitte, Corey Fleming, Russell Lafitte was like the banker. Corey Fleming was like his like um, lawyer friend. I think they went to college together or something. I think um, these are going to include the money that was stolen from the Satterfield family. Uh, it's going to include from the other victims as well that um, <clears throat> some of the other victims that we heard in the murder trial. So let's see what Harpootlian says. Uh, Mr. Harpootlian, yes, sir. Yeah, there are a number of different objections we have to trying uh, any previously got the impression from your honor when we met at the last status conference that you would not be trying any of these cases um, and you'd be leaving the bench on January 1. Tell me about that impression. Sorry, sorry, the audio is a little, uh, it, it'll, it'll be better. Again. That was my impression based on your discussion. Now, maybe I misread you. I've done that from time to time during the process. Um, um, if I did, I apologize. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Mr. Griffin and I have scheduled other matters for this fall. Um, I am, uh, Ikoki and I, uh, have a federal trial in December. Um, before that, Your Honor, and I think I mentioned this the last time we talked, um, I have a, uh, the oldest case in Lexington County, civil case, um, is, involves the death of five children killed by their father who sent them to death for it. We sued the Department of Social Services eight years ago, and finally on a trial docket, I, I've mentioned this, something I've mentioned. It's on a trial docket for home. Um, motions on the 14th of October, trial on uh, October, and I have a a, uh, email here from judge Please tell the judge has got a busy year. Trial on, um, motion heard on October 13th, trial on October, October 30th. And it's at least a two-week or three-week trial. Mr. Griffin had an additional conflict in Texas in a federal trial for day, October 30th, October 30th that week. Um, so uh, I guess uh, this is September. Um, it looks like most of October is going to be involved in getting ready for or trying that case wouldn't be done until uh, uh, early in November. Um, and, Your Honor, you know, it's going to take some time to get ready for these cases. But, but more importantly, maybe this is the, 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 uh, the, the toughest thing I have to say, and that is this. This case was tried, finished, six months ago. It clearly, I don't think anyone in this team has had more publicity than any case in the history of this state, and maybe the country. 
on national television every day for six weeks. The motions um, are uh, motions hearings were covered, and they're here again today. Um, it has been podcasted, blogged. Uh, you know, we've got podcasters out there um, who are, are ripping their 15 minutes, and hanging by their fingernails, wanting more of their 15 minutes of fame, and continue to talk about this. What does this kind of reminds me of? I don't know. Is this the Lane Rudderhoff argument? 15 minutes of fame? I understand <laughs> one of the solutions to um, massive pre drop publicity is a change of venue. There are two cases I want to cite to the court, um, both of the United States Supreme Court cases. Um, Murphy versus Florida, um, um, and um, the, 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 the cited, I'm sorry, Shepard versus Maxwell. There are two kinds of pre drop publicity that, that, that would indicate a continuance and or a change of venue required. Um, prejudice is presumed for pretrial publicity, but pretrial publicity is sufficiently prejudicial and inflammatory, and the prejudicial pretrial publicity is saturated community where the trials are held. Well, he didn't want to make an appearance here. Um, he tried to appeal to Judge Newman and say that he didn't want to appear in court today, but Judge Newman was like, no, you have to appear. They found presumed pretrial publicity in a case much less renowned, um, much less publicized than this one. Uh, and, Your Honor, uh, to try to try this case in less than a year after the verdict came in, in the other case, don't we need to let it calm down a little bit? Where are you going to get a jury? Mars? I mean, there's nowhere in this case. <laughs> So this is where Judge Newman is going to interject in because uh, Harpoolian's like, where are we going to get the jury from Mars? Allen Bell, Orange Bird, Buford, Colleton, Judge Newman, Hampton. I have none of this. It's not a sense of humor. We have many uh, counties where these indictments were issued. I'm not presuming that a jury cannot be impaneled. Uh, just as the trial that took place on Colleton County, there was no motion to change venue. Uh, and I'm not presuming any prejudice, uh, and the test is not um, based on speculation. The test is whether or not a jury can be impaneled. We first have to attempt to get a jury, according to the law. What I'm saying is, I think it'd be an exercise of utility. I know it's we've been interviewed. Okay, I'm going to slow down a little bit because the audio is a little bit ee. As you know, uh, in, the, in the murder trial, uh, there was a juror who, 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 on that jury who had been excused, been on the jury, panel was in the previous year and told other jurors, I want on this trial, I want on this trial, and that, I'm afraid, is what happened on that jury. We got a motion for a new trial after discovered evidence. Wait, so he said that there was a jury member who was dying to be on the Alex Murdoch jury panel? Is that what he said? Oh, Judge Newman. Jury uh, panel was in the previous year and told other jurors, been on the jury, panel was in the previous year and told other jurors, I want on this trial, I want on this trial, and that, I'm afraid, is what happened on that jury. We got a motion for a new trial after discovered evidence. Um, the court, uh, the Attorney General is going to file their response tomorrow. We believe the court will be able to order a jury um, before a circuit court judge um, to determine whether or not uh, the corporate court tampered with that jury. Mm. Yeah, I don't see Becky Hill there today. And that is very, and, and so we would go forward with another trial while that matter pending, while that matter being litigated. Yeah, probably not in Colorado County. <laughs> you know, the, the idea that somehow something happens in Colorado County doesn't affect what happens in Buford County. But, I mean, this is a national case. I mean, do they not have television in Allendale County? I don't do know. Do they not have the internet? I don't know. But what's the, what's the hurry? That's the other one. What is the hurry? He's pleading in federal court next Thursday. Every allegation the state has made, the victims will have their day in court. We plead, you know, we plead, uh, Mr. Murdoch indicated he pleads guilty to the state charge, but the state insists on doing them in serial so they get three convictions so they can get life without parole. By a guy who's already serving two life sentences without parole. This is just another attempt to get more publicity, to, to, to make this another national case. And, I, Your Honor, I'm offended. You keep pointing at everyone. All y'all want your 15 minutes of fame. Okay, now he's offended. What are you offended about, sir? Publicity to, to, to make this another national case. And, I, Your Honor, I'm offended uh, with the, that the Attorney General is waiting. He's got many other cases that are much older than this. But get granted, court TV won't be there for them. 
This is another effort at creating a national spectacle. Now, Your Honor has some things to say about Mr. Murdoch at a sentencing. You obviously believe he's guilty of that. You obviously and the jury found him guilty of that. Yep. But I would ask you to put those feelings aside and give us a chance to litigate this jury tampering issue to allow Mr. Griffin and I to have time, if there's going to be a trial on these, to prepare for those trials, which we won't put in our calendar uh, for the fall. And third thing is why didn't the Attorney General... So him telling the judge to put his feelings aside about, you know his thoughts about Alex Murdoch being guilty and the jury finding him guilty. I don't know. It, to me, it kind of sounds like he's kind of saying that, hey, Judge Newman, you're being biased right now. Please put your bias aside and listen to what I'm trying to say. Put some distance between the conviction in the murder case and the trial, if there has to be a trial, on the, uh, on the, uh, the uh, financial, financial cases. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm, as you know, I was a prosecutor president. I'm bewildered by this. I, I'm certainly they can do it, but why? Why? What is the hurry? Yeah, I mean, I can understand Harpootlian's frustration because his client has so much shit going on right now. So, you know, pleading for the guilty, uh, sorry, pleading guilty to financial crimes coming up next week. Uh, they're trying to work on the case with the jury tampering right now. They're going to hear back from the attorney. Uh, he said attorney general, right? Um, possibly tomorrow. And yeah, there's just so much going on. Um, they just finished up the murder stuff right now. And so Creighton wants to have the state financial trial to happen end of this year. <laughs> and Jim and Harpoolian are like, what? There's too, ah, there's just too much. Okay, let's see. But I don't know if I take by the argument, though. So he's saying that, like, oh, the reason why they want these to happen now, now, now is because they want their 15 minutes of fame. It's like, I, I think they just want to get it resolved and just close the books and just move on to other cases, you know? Oh, Jim, you want to speak up, Jim? No? Okay. Hi, Jim. No, this isn't about a spectacle. These, these white collar indictments have been investigated by the state grand jury, which is a partnership of the AG and SLED. And these particular, the Southfield indictments were indicted in November of 2021, uh, just about two months after the side of the road happened. Uh, this is about allegations that represent an assault on the state judiciary. And because of that, they need to be answered. Your Honor is exactly correct that the law does not presume prejudice. This is the judge using a drive through mic because I would like an order of large onion rings and a large chocolate milkshake. First of all, onion rings are gross. If he wants to file a motion where he cites law, I mean, then we can respond. But the law is very clear. It's that you don't presume prejudice. You try to seat a jury. And only through that process can the court then assess whether or not a jury can be seated. We are in 2023. The reality of the media environment is what it is. And unless we're going to say the judicial system just can't function because of publicity, that just leaves nothing left to happen. This is just the reality that we live in. And so we depend point. on the ability of the system, we depend on the ability of the jury selection process to seek jurors. And that is what should happen. And only if there is an inability to do so can uh, this court then consider whether or not there needs to be some change of venue or some relief or something like that. That is exactly what the process should be. And this is a big county. This is Buford County. And fundamentally, just as we rely on lawyers, just as we rely on judges uh, to be objective about what they do, and that includes the defense motion here. Okay? We have an objective duty. We also depend, the system depends on jurors to be objective as well. And to just say, because there's publicity, nothing can be done, just throws the system out and leaves no recourse whatsoever. And what the defense can't do is try to essentially run down the street to the federal authorities and bypass the accountability that needs to happen in state court for a direct assault through use of a state law license on this courtroom, Your Honor, on the other courtrooms or the other counties that I named. The state judiciary needs, the state judicial system needs to answer for this very, the allegations of this assault. And that's why this is important. That's why this case has priority. And that's why the state seeks to move it forward. Oh, man, look at Just a, 
Well, this wasn't his argument a year ago when he called the murder case first. The murder case was indicted after the uh, financial crimes, and it wasn't that important then. Now, all of a sudden, it's, you know, the most important thing in the world. Um, I, would, I would suggest, Your Honor, that he made a decision to try the murder case first, not the financial crimes, and as a result, we're, we've been put in the position, you know, of, of where we're at today. <laughs> Look at Crane. Crane's already standing. He's ready to respond. Uh, they're going to have a little back and forth here. In addition to that, I would state for the record, I want this clear. Based on our, that is, Mr. Griffin and my trial schedules in other cases between now and the end of the year, we would be ineffective in preparing for this trial, any trial. Your Honor, uh, that is absolutely not what happened. Uh, I even said I was happy to try, try the white collar cases first. It was the defense's motion for a speedy trial mm. and Mr. Harpoolian's waiver of his legislative immunity, which mm. what led to the murder cases being done before. It was the defense that wanted to trial the murder case. They filed a motion for speedy trial and the state said, okay, let's do it. He so was decision to agree with that, Your Honor. It's up to him. He called the case today. The solicitor calls the case. The prosecutor, we don't call the case. It was his decision. He decided to go with the murder case first. Your Honor, the state is... But they agreed to it because of your actions, though, Harpoolian. <laughs> ...happy to show up in court and seek justice for these very important matters whenever a date can be scheduled. And the only reason the murder went first was because of Mr. Harpoolian. Hi, Marissa. Harpoolian chicken his head. Um, I think Creighton won that argument. Of course, not going to defer to Texas and set on a trial date. And a trial date will be set prior to the end of this year. You all have a choice of either the week of November 13th, Ooh. November 27th, And there's an Allendale term scheduled. Man, Alec, Alec putting his uh, lawyers. Into overtime. Or December 11th. No, it's not the microphone. It's the um, it's the audio feed. It's like a mess up. So they just have to fix the audio feed, but they fix it after break because like they don't want to get up and like disturb the proceedings or anything like that. So it's not the judge's fault or anyone. It's the um, the setup, the lone crime or uh, whoever's doing the um, the feed. You all have a choice of long either long. of those three weeks to try whatever case is pending in those individual venues. Your Honor, could we confer and email you today on what our preferences are? No, we, we can confer and resolve it this morning while we maybe move on to the next matters. We have I'm, I'm other matters. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. So they didn't want the trial to happen Your before Honor, the end of this waiting. year. Um, my previous we made objections. Uh, November 27th would allow us to deal with these other trials, um, although not really give us time to prepare for this, because we've already heard my position on that. Well, uh, November 27th, uh, let's see. Like Thanksgiving? All right, let's see. That's a week after Thanksgiving. Oh, man. Yeah. And we're um, attempting to coordinate with other existing terms of courts in the various uh, places. Someone said the clerk court, the All court right. of clerks said that Poodle constipated in her book, and that's why he Your said Honor, it wasn't well written. 
Do we have this passage? It runs like I, a diary. I know that to what, whatever venue, the predominant number of cases are pending in Hampton County. All right, so I'm going to speed this a little bit because you're just going to choose which venue and all that stuff. Well, I guess. I feel too different because that is the greatest single loss. Um, but if, if there are scheduling issues, we, we will do Hampton. Uh, I do believe that uh, it makes the most sense to do that one first just because of uh, the way this case is developed uh, and so it's safe. Um, we seek to call that one. <clears throat> A lot of nicely dressed people in the gallery. Like everyone's dressed up to go to church or something. November 27th is a general sessions terms scheduled here in Beaufort County. For the 27th? Yes. That works for the state, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So I need to uh, coordinate with the solicitor's office as well. No, they will, we'll take care of whatever coordination is necessary unless there's a death penalty case scheduled that week. Thank you. All right, so the case is set for trial on November 27th. Um, is that the matter you're seeking, the Satterfield trial? Yes, sir. for any motions that might be filed. Uh, yes, sir, I think that's advisable. Um, I can look at my phone real quick, Your Honor. I would say uh, for the, because of the uh, week prior, obviously it's Thanksgiving, um, that perhaps the Friday the 10th might be the best day for motions and then uh, responses. Week. Maybe, All right, uh, I skip through this. Uh, this uh, scheduling stuff. None of this is a big concern. I feel like we just can't deal with it that morning. It, uh, I mean, our schedules really are complicated. Can we have the hearing that morning? Uh, the morning of the trial? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, a, a deadline for filing the motions. I don't have a problem with that. Ten days prior to trial and responses five days before trial. Okay. Okay. In effect, that's what you proposed. Yeah, I, I do. I have my father has attended this Veterans Day. Um, we could have the motion filed. <laughs> I know that I don't have to work on Veterans Day. Well, oh my God. I just want to get out of your eyes. Poor Harpoolian. I know the state government people enjoy this holiday, but we're going to have to rearrange a ma major personal item to deal with this. I plan to take Thanksgiving and visit my wife overseas. That ain't happening now. I've got to call when I leave here to tell her. So um, perhaps we'll have to work Veterans Day. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say these people next to me work just as hard as they do, and your honor saw that. We'll be working Veterans Day to one of your matches. That's a deadline. You, you, maybe you'll have it prepared the day before. Um, Veterans Day is on the, the Friday the 10th, is that it? Right. Well, well, the deadline would be Thursday the 9th. How about that? And responses in five days. And responses in five days will determine when and if a hearing is needed prior to the 27th. Yes, if you'll put all of that in order and circulate it about. State v. not Murdoch. Yeah, State v. Murdoch in the Satterfield case. Unless you want to voluntarily join in. I think you're right. I do not. We don't voluntarily join in. All right. Well. I promise you guys, audio will be fixed. All right. Well. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right. All right, goodbye, Alex. That's it for the matters of uh, Alex, the state financial crime, so that we're going to have a trial set for after Thanksgiving. Next, I think, will be... Oh, wait! Oh, this is... Okay, they're going to fix the audio, I think, at this point. Yay, I think. Let's see if the audio is fixed. Okay, so now we're moving on to Russell Lafayette. Let's see.
prepared and will be prepared for the board in any date that the uh, board sets. And the defense has some issues with that, so I will uh, to remind me um, about Mr. Well, if he's very some back. Hey, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Lafitte, we have 122 GF 4701 and 122 GF 4702. Uh, those are both um, venues in Hampton County. And those, uh, yeah, they're trying to fix it right now. Deal with, uh, County, we have to be two, 22 GS 4704. Uh, and then you have an Allendale County, and that the underlying victim there is uh, Mr. Badger. Two and a half and one and a half. Mr. Lord? Yes, sir, Your Honor. Uh, he's charged with Mr. Murdo on all three of those cases. The co defendants in all three of those cases. Uh, I would ask, Your Honor, because as I understand it, the state wanted to go first with the South Carolina matter. That case has been set. Um, I would ask, Your Honor, to set a trial date for one of these cases in the fall of next year. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, and I know Your Honor doesn't want to hear about the federal case, but it's inextricably intertwined here, and one of the things that I have to do to represent the thing is that I've got a briefing schedule, and we've got to deliver a briefing before Circuit Court of Appeals as well. We have to do that. Oh, that's Russell Lafitte right there. I don't have any choice for that matter. To deliver briefs where? To the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Yes, Concerning what? Well, so he is appealing his federal conviction. And so the Fourth Circuit set a briefing schedule. And they oh, that's right. I think he's the one that says that he was going to appeal his. Um, yeah, because he got a federal conviction, I think. Right. That's what he said. Um, he's going to appeal it because I think they were saying that, oh, Alex Murdoch during his murder trial said that I wasn't involved in any of this or that like, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I think that's why he's going to appeal. They originally set a schedule for uh, September the 28th. As I mentioned earlier, the United States Attorney's Office then filed a cross appeal. The, the Fourth Circuit consolidated those matters. They abrogated the briefing schedule, but now they will set a new briefing schedule. I expect to get a briefing schedule in the next week or two, and I expect, because of how quickly the other briefing schedule is set, that we'll go to the briefing schedule where that briefing we do at the end of October, or maybe, if I'm lucky, then no, no. Um, Hello. Way more time focusing on the Sorry, they're trying. The traffic's right now. Going to need the opportunity to do that, That may be very complicated because, again, I don't know today. Perhaps we'll know by next week whether he's going to get an appeal bond. Or not. If he does not get an appeal bond, he's going to be in Coleman, Florida where he's been designated to serve his sentence. And I need some time and some access to him to be able to prepare for his defense in this trial. And so I would, again, Mr. Rutherford, as legislative immunity, as Your Honor knows, I understand that the state may want to talk about trying the case in the spring, but I would ask Your Honor to set, and, and perhaps, I don't know if the state intends to try all three of the cases or not. Yeah, so we're setting a trial date for Russell Lafitte. Uh, I think Mr. Waters can speak to that. I'm not the president. But I would ask Your Honor to set those cases uh, for the fall. But I would see physically how I can try this case with this client this fall, given not only that appeal, but this discovery. I would be ineffective, I believe. And I don't want to be ineffective for this matter. All right. But that's not the state's fault uh, that Mr. Lafitte changed lawyers. Uh, the discovery of this matter had been out for a long time. Uh, and again, it is expensive, but as he said, much of the discovery is, um, very, is very similar and was generated by the state grand jury uh, as to uh, things that they've been reviewing in the other matter. Uh, it's the discovery we've provided is based yeah, sorry, the audio is pretty bad. I'm, I'm just going to skip through this, and then we'll just have to read about it later. Um, the audio does get better after they have their court break, so I think it'll be more bearable to listen to. But um, yeah, Russell Lafitte, um, I'll look up to see if they scheduled a hearing, um, sorry, a trial date for him. And as I described it at the plea, I think that the issue here is if we were in traffic court and the speed limit was 55, Mr. Fleming wants to say, well, I, I admit I did 58, and the state, if I'm the trooper, I'm like, no, Your Honor, we clock him doing 90. Uh, we've been in and out of traffic like video games. So what I'd like to do, Your Honor, with the court's indulgence is just kind of detail some of the facts 
uh, that show the true and, and real extent of the conduct here, because again, it does go to the heart of the state judicial system. Uh, Your Honor, these allegations here. So that right there is Corey Fleming. Um, this is going to be the sentencing for him. Involve the use of state law licenses in state court actions before state judges with state court approved settlements. So ultimately, Mr. Fleming has admitted to a violation and abuse of the state judicial system. And because of that, Your Honor, I would submit to the court that the state judicial system must defend itself. It must provide its own accountability for those who would abuse it. And that is what the state and I believe the victims will be asking Your Honor to do here today. Mr. Fleming admits that he conspired with Alec Murdoch to steal money in both the Pinckney matter and the Satterfield matter. He admits, that, like. he admits to colluding with Mr. Murdoch in the Pinckney matter when he was recruited by Mr. Murdoch to represent Ms. Pinckney because she was a driver in the crash, but also a plaintiff, and so they needed another lawyer involved in the case. Mr. Murdoch represented the other clients, including Hakeem Pinckney. And in the Satterfield matter, as Your Honor has heard, Mr. Murdoch recruited, put these cases in Mr. Fleming's lap in the Satterfield matter, where Mr. Fleming was going to represent the estate and represent the sons of Miss Gloria Satterfield, but Mr. Fleming was going to openly, or excuse me, behind the scenes collude with the defendant in that action. Not the attorney, but the defendant himself. And what Mr. Fleming, I think, wants the court to believe is even though the state grand jury he initially reported to everyone that he was a victim of Mr. Murdoch just like everybody else, hmm. just like Mr. Murdoch's law partners and just like his clients. He was tricked and fooled by Mr. Murdoch just like anyone else. But what happened was, was the state grand jury, which again is a partnership of the attorney general and SLED, and the people sitting around me and the SLED agents over there, right out of the gate, right out of the gate when we first got involved in September of 2021, and one of the things that we uncovered was that Mr. Fleming had been stealing checks from his clients going all the way back to 2012. Damn, he lying All the too. way back to 2012. So when Mr. Fleming tries to tell this court that, okay, I stole a little bit, but I really was hoodooed by Alec Murdoch as to the big money, I'd ask the court, the court to consider that and consider this entire chain of conduct and whether or not that makes common sense and whether or not that fits with the evidence. Your Honor, what we see at the beginning of this case, the Pinckney wreck occurred back in 2009. And it resulted in terrible injuries to members of that family, injuries that ultimately contributed to Hakeem's death, injuries that Ms. P, Ms. Pamela Pinckney is still, de still dealing with to this day. And what the evidence revealed is that Mr. Fleming knew how to interact with his clients. Early on, he's interacting with Ms. P. He's developing that personal relationship with Ms. P that you expect a lawyer to do in a case like this. He knows how to do it. But then what we see is at the same time where he's telling Ms. P he's taking care of her, he's spending time with her, he's going to her hospital bed, it doesn't take him long to steal a couple of checks so that he and Alec Murdoch can fly in a private plane and go to the College World Series. And he builds that. No one else did this. This is in his records from his law firm. He builds that to crosswind as if it is a medical expense. <laughs> And it was a private plane ride to go to the party with Miss P's money. And so when Mr. Fleming tries to tell you that he didn't really know what was going on throughout this entire decade-long scheme of conduct, I would ask Your Honor to take that into consideration when you look at what he really did and how long it's been going on. He dispersed a large sum of money to Miss Pinkney the right way. And there's no better feeling, I am told, for a plaintiff's lawyer or their staff that when they get to call in that person who's been hurt, who's suffered, and say, I know you've been hurt, I know you've been suffered, but I've got a check of life-changing money for you. Here it is here today. And in fact, that's how usually the scheme works because those, those clients, those victims, are so distracted by the big check in front of them mm. that they're not paying attention to the slight hand behind them. And that's what Mr. Fleming did with his law license. Mr. Fleming stole those crosswind checks in 2012. 
And one of the facts I have to reiterate for your honor is we mentioned another civil action in which Mr. Fleming was not actually the defendant, but he pretty much was the defendant because it was a close family member who was the defendant. And what the investigation revealed was that Mr. Fleming, as essentially the defendant, was doing the legal work in the case, and they were essentially using Alec Murdoch's name as the plaintiff's lawyer, to the point where there's an email where Mr. Fleming sends to Alec Murdoch's staffer the petition and the order with the settlement in there and says, hey, I need you to send it to the defense lawyer so it doesn't look like it came from me. <laughs> and this man wants to try to convince you that he didn't really know what was up in his dealings with Alec Murdoch. Ultimately, in that case, Your Honor, the order that was submitted, the settlement, reflects $48,000 in legal fees that were supposed to go on the, on the paper to Alec Murdoch. But instead, they ended up in the pocket of essentially the defendant. And yeah, his he's passionate. And that's ultimately how the state grand jury figured it out, because we saw this $48,000 reference, but no $48,000 check coming in to the PMPED law firm. But does it sound familiar, Your Honor? Again, I would ask you to consider that it was essentially Satterfield in reverse. Except this time, Mr. Fleming was the beneficiary as essentially the defendant of receiving monies that were supposedly going to the plaintiff and the plaintiff's counsel. Man, these people are so greedy. Your Honor, that was going on 2012 through 2014, around the time that Mr. Fleming first stole from Ms. Pinkney. And years go by, to all the way to 2017, and Mr. Fleming still has money belonging to Ms. Pinkney in his account, money that he had retained supposedly for satisfaction of liens. But what we found, what we uncovered, was that was a perfect delta of money. Because once you settle those liens, or you just don't even settle them at all, that's money then that you can steal or steal from. And in 2017, Mr. Murdoch cuts the check for $4,560 and delivers it to Alec Murdoch and causes it to be delivered for fake expenses of Ms. P's money. Again, when you consider what he's trying to convince you, think about the entire course of conduct here and how these two men operated together. But more importantly, he also cuts a check for $89,000, over $89,000 of Ms. P's money, and cuts it to PMP, and Alec Murdoch promptly converts it to Forge. This is a man, again, who knew how to interact with Ms. P, who had interacted with Ms. P, who had sat by her bedside as she suffered from the injuries of that wreck. Does he call up Ms. P in 2017 and say, great news, I got $89,000 more of your money. Does he call up that client that he had that personal interaction with? No. He just gives it to PMP and D, gives it to Alec. <laughs> Makes no effort to contact her. Again, when we look at this entirety of these events, and Mr. Fleming tries to tell you, okay, I got caught red-handed stealing a little bit, but I didn't know about all this other stuff. It doesn't fit with the evidence. It doesn't fit with common sense. Damn, who's trying to blame everybody? But if we have any question, like... and we're going to get to the three checks in the Satterfield matter. There were three checks. There were one check for over $400,000 that Mr. Fleming made, made out from his trust account to the, just the single word forge, which in and of itself is ridiculous, just the word forge. A second check for over $2.9 million. This is money that's supposed to go to this family right here, Your Honor, made out to the word forge. <laughs> and a third check for $118,000 made out to the word forge. All of that money was supposed to go to this family, and it doesn't. So Alec had like um, these fake forge accounts that he would use, and he would transfer the money over to there. Mr. Fleming, it was mentioned during the murder trial. I believe wants to convince Your Honor that when he cut those checks representing the proceeds that were supposed to go to this family, and gave those, caused those to be delivered to Alec Murdoch, made out to forge, that he didn't know that Alec might take any of that money. That he thought every penny of that money was going to go to those boys, and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense with the history here, and it doesn't make sense with the specific evidence in this case. And let's talk about the first thing that we have. Aside from, just it doesn't make common sense. It doesn't make common sense to make out a check just to the word forge. It doesn't make sense because forge doesn't take money in the traditional sense. It doesn't make sense because his own staff testified that Mr. Fleming did everything differently in this case. It doesn't make sense because Mr. Fleming, unlike we know how he does to do with Mr. P, never made an effort to talk to the Satterfield family. Never made an effort to find out if they got their money. Never contacted them. Never called them up and said, great news. Never told the PR that they pretty much brought in as a patsy to do that either. 
Never told him what to do. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, Your Honor. In December... Can you imagine being a victim against someone so known in the community that you don't even know how to even go after them, what lawyers even hire? I'm so glad now, like... This is a very public thing, and this has a lot of, like, eyes on it. But, like, man, imagine being one of the victims and just finding out, like, hey, I think this attorney who's really well-known in this county, really well-connected, reputed, I think he stole money from me. 27, though, if we had any illusion that Mr. Fleming, when he cut those checks to forge... And most people ain't got money laying around to pay for a lawyer and stuff, you know? Hmm. So I'm so glad that, you know, Creighton is the one who's, like, spearheading this. I'm so glad that there's a lot of, like, eyes on this. Because, yeah, it, it sucks. I his trust account. Goes. When he received the settlement money in his trust account, that that's not how you do a structure. We have that email, email that I detail for your honor where Michael Gunn at the legitimate forge explained to Mr. Fleming and the staffer, you received the money. We can't set up a traditional structure. What year was that again? That was in December 20th, 2017 was that email. And that was State's Plea Exhibit number 5, your honor. And I have another copy of Plea Exhibits, uh, if your honor. I don't know if your honor has yes, them. Yes, sir, if you would. I'll pass those up. That was December 2017, just a few months later, in February of 2018. Gloria Satterfield, a longtime housekeeper for the Murdochs, fell at Moselle suffered injuries from which he ultimately succumbed on February 26, 2018. And your honors heard evidence that not long after that, Alec Murdoch told the Satterfield family that he was going to take care of them. He was going to make sure that they got taken care of for their mother's death, for her long service to that family. And who did he bring in? His longtime co-conspirator, Corey Fleming. But Corey Fleming only met with them once or twice, if that, met with them a couple times. He never had them sign a, plea, a fee agreement, which is common practice, as your honor knows, required practice. He never updated the Satterfields on the status of the case. He never advised them about the recoveries. He never advised them of the settlement offers. He never advised them that money was being directed to the forge. He never, of course, told them that he and Mr. Murdoch, as I'll detail, were dipping into their money for their own personal gain and expenses. And what's most important, Your Honor, is Mr. Fleming never told this family, never told Chad Westendorf, the PR that they put in as a patsy, what he's going to try to claim to Your Honor now, that he generously cut his fee in half. <laughs> oh, my God. Imagine being the victims where you have this attorney. I'm going to do you guys a good one. I'm going to do you guys a solid. I'm going to cut my attorney fees in half. Yes, yes, I know, I know. I'm doing good for you guys. And then you find out this motherfucker stole all your money. Oh, my God, this guy, what a clown. What a clown. And had no idea that Alec was going to take any of the other half of that fee. That's what he's trying to claim now. Cut his fee in half. And never once tells the PR that. Never once tells them that. You know what kind of lawyer I am? I'm going to cut my fee in half. $600,000 is enough for me. And why doesn't he tell them that? Because he's got an arrangement with Alec Murdoch and all the evidence in this case reflects it. Mm. It works out to be just like a fee split you see over and over again. And the reality is, the reason is, is because they co-litigated the case. Alec Murdoch functioned as co-counsel with Corey Fleming, co-plaintiff's counsel in a case where Alec was the defendant. It was a shakedown. Plain and simple. These boys, this family, deserve compensation. But they were nothing but a vehicle for Mr. Fleming and Mr. Murdoch to steal money. Again, looking at common sense and what the evidence reflects. But in November of 2018, there's two policies, one for 500K, Lloyds of London, and they pay on the policy. Well, guess what? At that point in time, Tony Satterfield is the PR of the estate. That's Mr. Fleming's client. Does Mr. Fleming call up Mr. Satterfield and say, Tony, great news, they tendered the policy limits, first checks in, 500K, half a million dollars? No, <clears throat> he does not do that at all. In fact, he, and we have the email, instructs his staff, hold this check until we can get the PR changed. Hold this until we can get the PR changed. Why in the world 
did he do that if he thought that that money was legitimately going to go to those boys? It's not. It was meant to put in the patsy so they could cover up what they were about to do. And the evidence is clear, Your Honor. That's the state's plea exhibit number six. In fact, they get the check. Lloyd DeLondon cuts that check on December 4th, and they make it out to Chad Westendorf. He hasn't even been designated as a PR yet. They haven't even changed it yet. They already get the check made out to Chad Westendorf. And Westendorf was clear, and the evidence was clear, that he was not instructed what to do. In fact, he was always told by Mr. Fleming, I got it. I'll handle it. Do I need to do anything? Do I need to, do I need to open a bank account? No, I got it. I'll handle this first. That's not Ellick. That's Mr. Fleming saying that according to the evidence gathered in this case. In December of 2018, Mr. Satterfield is convinced by Ellick to sign over being PR of the estate so that this scheme can take effect. And an order is filed that retroactively says the date was back in March of 2018, which is a fabrication. <laughs> what date was that again? December 6, 18, 2018 is when the uh, PR change is, is uh, issued. That's plea exhibit number seven. And the date in plea exhibit seven, if you look at that document. Uh, Wait, is this his prison outfit or is that like his normal outfit? What is his outfit? I can't see the bottom. It says that, that it was effective from March 28, 2018. Again, plea exhibit seven. Complete fabrication. They look like pajamas, yeah. March. Tony was the PR. This is all after the fact to hide what they're about to do. And so when he says he thought that that check that he got to forge, which he cut shortly after this, for $403,000, was actually going to go to an account for those boys, aside from the fact that that's not how it works, and it makes no sense, and it's made out to a single word forge, it's all an after the fact <laughs> reconstruction to put in their patsy so they don't know that they've gotten recovered. And Mr. Fleming is at the center of that. Aside from the fact that even if he tries to claim that when he handed those checks to his co-conspirator abusing the judicial system, if the, I didn't know what you know my fellow thief was going to do with it, that's not even good enough under the law anyway. When you're conspiring with somebody, you're responsible for the natural and probable consequences of that act regardless. But even, even that being the case, he knew, and the evidence is clear. I want to be clear. The state has never contended that Mr. Fleming thought that Alec was going to steal every single dime. Because that's not usually how the scheme works, right? As, as I just said, you're usually handing some big check, life-changing money to people who've never had that kind of money before, and they're so distracted by that they don't realize you're stealing right from behind them. True. But for Mr. Fleming to claim that when he delivered those forged checks representing the vast bulk of all this money, that he thought that every dime was going to go to those boys, it defies common sense, it defies the evidence, it defies what he knew how things were supposed to work. Man, I have a, I have a headache. I was up so Mr. late last night. <laughs> <laughs> communicates with Tony Satterfield about the change of the PR, never once communicates with Tony Satterfield about a recovery of half a million dollars. Instead, he deposits the check that they had pre-made out to Chad Westendorf even before the change of PR. And then Mr. Fleming prepares a petition for approval of wrongful death settlement in an order. And that order says that there's going to be $166,000 in attorney's fees, which is the standard percentage. But that's not what happened. It also has in there, on the nose, $11,500 in expenses, which are completely fraudulent. Didn't exist. And what Mr. Fleming's own staff revealed is that in the Satterfield case, every step of the way, normally when they're preparing the disbursement sheets, they're getting all the receipts from the expenses, you know, depositions, travel, uh, mediator expenses, all that. And she's getting them all together and she's itemizing them and, and doing all the math for that disbursement sheet for the client to sign. And instead, he's no, stop. This is the numbers I want you to put down. That was Mr. Fleming doing that, not Eleanor. I don't know, man. Cousin Eddie you ain't going to give him <laughs> Alex won't have anyone to get the pills from. Cousin Eddie done. Please exhibit nine, Your Honor. I don't like that stuff. So. Yeah, I'm sure you're going to make me groggy. January 7th, 2019, they get Chad Westendorf to sign a disbursement statement. Again, it's got those Hi, fraudulent expenses of $11,500 on there. This time it does indicate that the attorney's fees is $50,000. Again, cutting the fee, but never telling anybody, telling Mr. Westendorf, hey, let the clients know what a great attorney I am. I'm cutting my fee in half, for less than half. I have the goodness of my heart. 
Never says that. What, what does that tell you, Your Honor? Why would somebody do that and not let the people who are supposedly benefiting from that know? The only reason you're doing that is because you're creating a delta for your co-conspirator mm. to steal. Yep. Mr. Fleming, when that check gets cut, Mr. Westendorf's like, what do I do, man? Tell me what I need to do. And he says, I'll handle the disbursement. Mr. Fleming does. I'm going to pay some medical expenses, which he never does. Absolutely never does. January 17th, 2019, just a week later or so, that first money has come in. It's in Corey Fleming's trust account. And this is the first evidence where we see Mr. Fleming be like, yeah, that's a lot of money. I think I'll just go down and take some of it. And he goes down to a staff member and says, cut me an $8,000 check made out to me. Didn't they have a photo of his like family member in the courtroom somewhere? Wasn't it taken down or something? From the trust account of money belonging to this family and say it's expenses for the case. They're completely <laughs> fraudulent. We can look at Mr. Fleming's accounts. He may not remember why he did it, but we can see why he did it. Bank records tell a story, and we can see the balance in his account, how low it was, and we can see that money come in, and it immediately goes to pay a mortgage and other personal expenses. <laughs> Needed the money, had their money, and just walked down to a staffer's desk and said, cut me a check. Stole <clears throat> Ultimately, there's a mediation. Yeah, I remember Judge even talked about it. And Mr. Murdoch is there, and ultimately they collude during the course of that. <clears throat> Mr. Murdoch. Hi, Linda. Like, but I gotta get me something out of this. I gotta get me something out of this, Corey. They accept an offer, settlement offer for $3.8 million. Does Mr. Fleming tell this family? Nope. About such a momentous event? No. Does he try to communicate with them? No. Does he tell them, oh, I got y'all $3.8 million. I can take $1.4 million in fees from that, and I'm going to cut it in half out of the goodness of my heart. Does he do that? No. Why? Because he <coughs> is creating that delta for his co-conspirator. Because they have the patsy in there so that they can get the scheme done. And they tell Mr. Westendorf again, we got it. Mr. Fleming says to Mr. Westendorf, I'll take care of this first. I'm good. Three point eight million dollars coming in. I stayed up late last night listening to a Mormon stories. I'm not finished yet, but oh my god, I was up so late. Ah, couldn't sleep. That's a big day, and Mr. Fleming doesn't wait a moment because on March 26th he goes right back down to his staffer and says, "Hey, cut me a check for eighty-five hundred dollars for expenses in the estate of Laurie Satterfield, which are completely fraudulent." Couldn't wait one day. Let me go ahead and put eighty-five hundred bucks in my pocket. And again, we can look at his account and see how low his balance was, and we can see immediately the vast majority of that money, he has to make a payment of taxes. Again, there's no illusion about the motive here. Hi, Virtus. He was broke and he needed the money, so he just stole it from his family because he had it in his trust account. How was he so broke? What were they doing? Were they just like fucking spending so much money on like their nice lavish houses or PJs? Nice cars. Like, where was all this fucking money going? Same thing with Alec as well. Like, what, what were they spending their money on? Multiple beach properties or something? Well, they got $3.8 million. And again, if you have any illusions about Mr. Fleming believing that when he cut those checks to Forge, that $2.9 million check, which is the next check that he cut to the single word Forge, that he really thought that every dime of that money was going to this family, well, the emails pr prove otherwise. <laughs> oh, no, and these are crucial, Your Honor. States uh, exhibits thir 13 and 14. Because the adjuster at Nautilus is like, I, I don't understand. What, what, tell me how to cut this check. Is he doing Nautilus is the insurance company. Doing a structure or not? But does he want a, a single check? We need to know. Because if he's going to do a structure, he has to do it this way. And Mr. Grantland sends it to Mr. Fleming. Says, what, what do you want me to tell him? And Mr. Fleming's like, well, says so the things. He's like, well, I got to check with Forge, which is a lie, because he's not dealing with real Forge at all. And, and they don't have an answer. So again, Mr. Grantland sends the same question. That the adjuster from Nautilus is saying, how are we cutting this check? I, this is the, the email. I need some clarification here. If he has a structure, don't we need to wait for information on the structure? Is he wanting us to fund the structure? Or is he funding the structure? If he wants us to fund the structure, it must go through Greenwood. 
If he doesn't want us to fund the structure, does he want the funds to consist of a single check in the amount of $3.8 million payable to Chad Westendorf as PR? And the Nautilus attorney forwards that to Fleming and says, let me know what I need to tell her. And eventually, on April 1st, 2019, Mr. Fleming says, okay, standard check. Chad Westendorf as PR and MKNF as attorneys, there was no structure that Mr. Fleming knew. Aside from the fact that's not how it works, he couldn't take the money directly. You can't do a structure in the traditional sense that way. These emails prove it. He tells them standard check. And of course, that check is cut through his trust account. In May 9th, 2019, Mr. Fleming tells the knowledge attorney, you don't have to come to the hearing. And then, Your Honor, this is State's Plea Exhibit 18, and this is a crucial thing as well that refutes Mr. Fleming's claim that he was only doing 58 miles per hour. Because again, his staffer starts to prepare a disbursement sheet, and she's searching for legitimate expenses, and she puts on there that there were disbursements to forge for Lloyds of London of $403,500, and there's disbursements to Nautilus of $2.9 million and change, and also puts on there the fees. And Mr. Fleming, not Mr. Murdoch, Mr. Fleming goes down and tells his staffer, no, stop, stop, don't, don't do it like that. Put these numbers down. Without any support, just tell her, no, I want these numbers. And that's in plea exhibit 19. And what's crucial about that, Your Honor, is that any reference to forge is removed. And the one they actually give to Chad Westendorf. It's removed. And what's also crucial about that disbursement uh, statement, Your Honor, state's plea exhibit 19, that they give to Chad Westendorf to, to sign is that it's got the full fee, collective fee between the two recoveries of $1.4 million on there. It lists that they are taking the full fee. That's what he tells the PR. He doesn't tell the PR, oh, by the way, I'm good to my heart. Please tell the boys, I'm such a great lawyer. I'm so generous. 600000 is enough for me. Cut it in half. He doesn't do that. No, he puts the entire fee on that. And why does he do that? He does that to create the delta for his co-conspirator to get his half of the fee split. There's no other reasonable explanation, Your Honor. Particularly when you look at the entirety of the course of conduct of these two men together. Bro, they took everything. So, Mr. Fleming takes his fee of... I wonder what their plan was, though. Were they planning on taking the money and then, like, telling the boys, like, oh, hey, like, sorry, the settlement didn't happen? Or were they planning on just borrowing the money for now because they had a lot of, like, other shit to pay off? And then somehow get the money later on? Like, what was their plan here? This is crazy. 600 k for Nautilus and 50 for Lloyd's. And then causes that check to be made out to Forge and has it delivered ultimately to Mr. Murdoch. <laughs> I, I, I wonder if they just had no intentions of paying the Satterfield family at all. A number of months go by, and they still have money that they've retained belonging to the Satterfields. Mind you, the Satterfields don't have a dime. The Satterfields don't even know that one solitary cent has been recovered on their behalf. They don't know any of that. And over $4 million has been recovered in their behalf, and no one has told them a thing. Certainly not Mr. Fleming, whose responsibility it was. And he can't hide behind the fact that, oh, well, I was dealing with Chad Westendorf because he specifically didn't tell Chad Westendorf what to do, and he specifically participated in conspiring to put Chad Westendorf in there as PR as a patsy to keep the truth from coming out to these boys in this family. But, still got money in the trust account. Mr. Fleming needs some walking around money. So, January 2020, goes on down to a staffer and says, hey, cut me a check for $9,700 out of the Southfield money from the trust account. Make it again, payable to me. This time he didn't even, it's not so easy, he didn't even bother to try to put on their expenses for the estate or anything like that. There's no justification, just cut me a check out of $9,700. And he spent that money on personal debt. Again, if we have any illusion about what Mr. Fleming knew when he was colluding with Alan Murdoch, or that he At first he was using new clients money to pay older clients and his debt grew so much he started taking money like no tomorrow. How, what the fuck was he spending his money on? Because I think what probably was the genesis of all this was how they were paid, how these lawyers are paid, right? Um, so at Alex Murdoch's attorney, sorry, Alex Murdoch's um, uh, legal firm, what they do is they pay the attorneys like some base salary, right? But there's like a giant bonus that they get at the end of the year. So I can see Alex Murdoch thinking like, oh, it's harmless. You know, I'm just going to take some of the settlement money and I'm just going to pay myself first. And I'll make sure to pay these girls like, you know, later on when I get my bonus at the end of the year. So I think that's probably how this all started. He probably needed some money and he thought, you know, he could just 
discreetly borrow some money from some of his clients. There are some clients where he was like holding money for um, because like they would get the money payout like, I don't know, by the time they turn like 18 or something like that, like the full payout, right? Um, so I can see that's how he probably started. But damn, was he just like buying all these houses, boats and stuff like that? Deb kept growing like motherfucker just getting greedy. Jesus. I like that it was 400 BC. There's no records. That's what I'm thinking too. I'm just like, there's like records for a lot of these things. Like say, for example, the Satterfield boys could ultimately end up finding out that, hey, you said that there was no settlement, but I contacted the insurance company and they said that there was like, and they have a record saying it was dispersed on this date. Like, I don't know. I guess they really thought that they can just pull a fast one on these people. Um, they probably just thought that they were highly trusted and yeah, damn it, it's still fucked. He really thought that this money was going to the family, despite this entire course of conduct that was specifically designed to keep them from knowing a thing. There's still money in the account. 17 months go by, Your Honor, in October of 2020. And a couple things happened. Couple things. The first thing is, is that Mr. Fleming signs a stipulation of dismissal for the case. And did they involve the Nautilus attorney? Does he sign it? No. The only other person that signs it is Alec Murdoch, the defendant himself. And concurrently with that, at the same time, the next day, October 6, 2020, he causes another check to be cut from his trust account made out to the single word forge for $118,000 and has that delivered to Alec. Now what's interesting, Your Honor, is that when we look at that $118,000 and then the, actually there was still $113,000 that was remaining in his trust account when all of this stuff came to light, it totals $231,000, which in their sentencing memorandum, they admit, they, they attribute that to Mr. Fleming. But how in the world can they attribute that one eighteen in October 2020 when he disperses that to Alec to forge and they signed that stipulation of dismissal with the defendant himself. How can he say that he knew that that forged check was bad, but not the other forged checks? The whole thing stinks to high heaven. The whole thing is done under any. The whole thing is done to prevent the system from knowing what was going on. And yeah, it's just crazy to me that they didn't get anything. Not, not even just a little bit. <laughs> prevent his family from knowing what was going on. It was designed that way, and he was part and central to it, crucial to it, from the very beginning. Mr. Fleming might try to tell you for his counsel, that when everything came to light, he was appalled. And eventually, as everything came to light, and actually after requests were made, or demands were made, disgorged his fee. Well, Your Honor, you don't get to rob a bank, run down the road, and the police catch you, and say, oh, here's the money back, we're cool, right? It's <coughs> not how it works. <laughs> and what he didn't do was say, oh yeah, by the way, I've been stealing checks from these accounts for almost a decade. He didn't come clean with that. It took the state grand jury to catch him red-handed for him to finally recognize that he was caught. And he could no longer claim to be like so many other people, yet another poor, unfortunate victim of Albert. No, he was the co-conspirator. Hi, Chopper. Your Honor, when we total up, the loss is attributed directly to Mr. Fleming's conduct in this case. Between the Satterfields and the Pinkneys, that total was three million seven hundred twenty-five thousand two hundred three dollars and eighty-five cents. We're not going to make some merch in prison. But everything about this case and how it was done <laughs> shows you that his Johnny come lately mitigating. I'll only admit to what very, the very minimum. I'm only was doing fifty-eight miles an hour. Everything about this course of conduct refutes that. Aside from your honor, just good old plain common sense common sense about how this was done. <coughs> hey, Nikki C. Your Honor, I'd like at this time, if it's tuggled to the court, to let some of the victims address the court, and then I, I'll have a few more comments uh, before I will yield to the defense presentation. Uh, and I will also request the opportunity for to speak after the defense presentation to address any issues they may raise. Uh, but at this time, um, very good. Before you do that, let's all just take a moment to um, yes. stretch for a moment. Oh, no doubt, take a moment. Oh,
Man, Judge Newman takes his stretch break seriously. I love it. All right, y'all, get up and stretch. Oh, man. <laughs> So we're going to have some of the victims. Uh, they're going to speak. Eric Bland, who's representing the Satterfield family, is going to speak as well. Also another very passionate lawyer. <laughs> Dude can barely drink his water. Damn, they really have him um, handcuffed up. Oh yeah, that is his prison attire. Looks comfy though. like to address the court is uh, Mr. Tony Sackett. Okay. Oh, Tony. So Tony Satterfield again uh, testified during the uh, Murdoch murder trial. Uh, this is attorney Eric Bland right there. Um, so first, I just want to say this is actually a life cycle everyone. Sorry, the audio is a little bit bad, so I'm going to slow it down for here. It'll get better. You know, a lot of times, you know, we think our actions do not affect other people, but they do. Um, bad and good. Um, uh, Mr. Thing, Mr. Satterfield, if you will address your comments to me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, the thing I'd like to say is um, that my answer still stands. You know, I still forgive Mr. Fleming. Um, and as far as the sentencing goes, you know, that's left up to you, um, Your Honor. Um, that's why, you know, you're in this situation to give that uh, myself. Um, and I just, the main thing, you know, I so I don't, this microphone, I don't think it's hooked up to the feed. That's why it's a little bit like bubbly. I'm going to get asked, well, what do you think? How do you think it went? Me personally, my honest answer, I don't care. I just want God's name to get the glory for it. You know, I just want you know, to get his name to the top. All right. Thank you. Junior Abwin, glory sister. This is Gloria Satterfield's Good morning. sister. Um, first of all, I would like to say that um, our family, of course, was affected in a tremendous way that hurt us deeply because we not only trusted the system, we trusted, we thought what was family to us. And um, yes, Mr. Fleming did wrong and he admitted what he'd done. And yes, he should be punished for what he's done. But we do forgive. As a Christian family, we believe in forgiving but it still does not take away the hurt that he caused us. And also, we feel like Gloria did not die in vain because her case actually brought out a lot of other corruption and dishonest deeds that were done to other people. And we feel like that it is being served now. Things are coming to light that should have been brought to light a long time ago. And I want to thank the state for all the work that y'all have done to bring everything to light. And Mr. Warden, you've done a fantastic job this morning bringing out everything and actually simplifying a lot of stuff. Um, and thank you very much. Judge, thank you so much. We trust in you and your honor that you will make the right decision in your sentencing. And again, we do forgive Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and everybody also. Judge Newman, my name is Eric Land, and I have the honor of speaking on behalf of the Satterfields. Yes, sir. I also have the honor of speaking as a lawyer of 35 years on behalf of other lawyers. Lawyers who are overwhelmingly honest and do good by their clients. The license we have is a sacred trust. It's a trust that we have to help our clients. It's not a ticket or a license for us to take from our clients. And, you know, it's natural that we want to dislike criminals. We want to dislike people like Mr. Fleming. But you're going to hear from a courtroom of people that he's a nice guy. But unfortunately, nice guys sometimes do criminal activity. And so you have to balance today not only the sentencing of a man, 
but sentencing the crime. Because our profession, a profession that I love, a profession that you love and dedicated your life to, has been stained. And you, you understand that when things like this happen, when lawyers take money from their clients, especially in this case when it's millions and millions of dollars, that the joke... Well, that's because used car salesmen are really well-dressed. ...jokes multiply <laughs> by 10. I've never liked lawyers. That's a compliment right there. I don't there. like people mocking lawyers. I don't like the nasty things that sometimes that people say. But one, one criminal activity in this type of case germinates and hurts our profession for a long, long time. Now, I think it's important that you do understand that Mr. Fleming knew exactly what he was doing. He is a plaintiff's lawyer. He has settled plaintiff cases before. And in this particular case, he worked with the party he was making a claim against. It's, it's, it's impossible to get your arms around that. He didn't have client permission to do that. He never had a fee agreement to do what he did with the client. We know, and Your Honor knows, the contingency fee agreements have to be in writing. There was no contingency fee agreement. There was no joint sharing agreement with the, uh, Mr. Murrow, even though he couldn't do it uh, to begin with, to disclose to the client. There were no disclosures at all to the client. He met Tony Satterfield as the PR one time. There never was any communication. I've been suing lawyers for probably 30 of my 35 years. I have never seen every single dollar taken from a seller. You mm. see sometimes that it's, you know, a portion of it. But in this case, they took every single dollar and never communicated with Tony Savage. Never they were so greedy. Hey, Thomas, how are you doing today? Never communicated with Brian Harry, his brother. They, they, they recovered millions of dollars. They should have been applauded for recovering that on behalf of Gloria Savage. You're going to hear that Mr. Fleming said, he won't use the word victim like he used for the last two years, where he said that he was a victim just like everybody else. But you're going to hear kind of off words. They're close. Maybe a first cousin of victim. You're going to say he didn't understand what was going on. Sure he did. If you're going to do a structure, your honor knows that you have to have insurance policy that represent that structure. Your honor knows that when you have two beneficiaries of that structure, there would be two separate policy numbers. One for Tony, one for Brian. Your Honor knows that if you're going to send a check to the structured insurance company... Sorry, I'm laughing because <laughs> I remember during the murder trial, someone brought up like, oh, so what, did Alec, like, was he buck naked riding his... What was it again? It wasn't a tractor, it was like go-karts or something, back to like the house or something. <laughs> Fucking rain, shut up. <laughs> That's why I'm like smirking right now. I, that's just a horrible impression to have in our heads, okay? <laughs> why did you have to go and resurrect that up for us? You gotta allocate. You can't just send a check for $2.9 million to an insurance company and not have any reference on the check that this amount is for Brian and this amount is for Tony and it needs to be deposited in this account and applied to that insurance policy number. None of that was done. Mr. Fleming sent the check without a cover letter. No, no letter to, to Forge to say, hey, this is how it's allocated. It was sent to a P.O. box in Hampton, South Carolina. Every plaintiff lawyer knows that Forge is in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, this is Eric Bland. Uh, he's an attorney that's representing the Satterfields. Bland, Georgia. Not in some P.O. box. Oh, who is this guy? Oh, this is Corey Fleming. It's his sentencing today. Um, Alex Murdoch was in um, the hearing earlier for his, um, it was a like status hearing for the state financial crimes. So they have a trial date set for that already. Now we're doing the, um, the sentencing for Corey Fleming. More importantly, the three checks that Mr. Waters described were signed on the back by Alex Murdoch himself. It says, DBA, Alex Murdoch, DBA Forge. And that would give it away, way away, that um, he was not doing a regular structure. This is a case, Your Honor, that was really two letters they were saying. And Wait, can we take the time to appreciate this glorious handlebar mustache right here? What? Amazing. And, you know, magically, $4.3 million was produced. A tremendous amount of money. Not that Gloria or any other person isn't worth that. But that is a very large settlement. A settlement that would probably be three times larger than most other counties in our state. And Mr. Fleming took $11,500 in expenses in case that there was no filing fees. In a case that there was no depositions, in a case that there was no experts, he had a signed disbursement sheet in May of 2019, signed by a judge, just like you. And when you sign an order, we have to follow it. But he took that order, and he never filed it with the clerk of court, despite getting a letter from the insurance company that said, before you disperse on that check, make sure you get a signed order and file it. But what did he do? He didn't file it. What did he do? He went into the chambers of Judge Carmen Mullen down here. 
And he told her, look, we've made a decision to change the caption on the case. Instead of it going to be the estate of Gloria Satterfield deceiving versus Alex Murdoch, we decided to take Mr. Murdoch's name off the caption. No, I can't do that without your honor's permission. But that was done without a court order. And then they took off Gloria Satterfield. Wait, so when the judge did that, was it improper or did the judge also get duped as well? What's going on here? I'm a little more curious about the judge. A state and deceive it to make it look like she wasn't even dead at all. And what did they do? They came back after they got that signed order. After they told Judge Carr in a moment, this is how we're going to disperse it. There was no reference that they were going to send 2.9 million of the 3.8 million to Forge. They were going to disperse it to Brian and Tony. What did they do? They just totally disregarded that order and started cutting checks, a check cutting, check cutting party on May 14. No, no court permission. You know, if I'm going to deviate from the order you signed from the disbursement sheet, I better come back before your honor and do that. No permission from the court was done. Nothing. No communication with these clients. This young man here, who's a vulnerable adult, who's in his thirties, lost his. Oh, a lot of these people must be um, maybe some of the victims. Maybe. I was like, oh, there's a lot of really nicely dressed people in court today. Um, he's not a defense attorney here. He's in a plaintiff attorney right now. Mother, Alex Murdoch and Corey Fleming knew that his trailer was being foreclosed on and he didn't have the money. And they're sitting on $4.3 million of their money while he's getting pushed out on the street and loses his mother's trailer. That was all she had. That was all she had. What happens? He keeps money in his trust account. Judge Mullen signed an order that said, you disperse every single penny in your trust account. As Mr. Wooder said, he kept it for 18 months in a case that, that was over with. In a case that he went before Judge Mullen and said in May, I need $105,000 of additional expenses that we spent. That's going to be dispersed. Again, in a case that no, let, no, no lawsuit, no depositions, no expert witnesses, and it was $105,000, not $105,100. Is this in relation to Murdoch mistrial stuff? No. So um, this is in regards to all the state financial crimes um, by Murdoch and his two co-conspirators, uh, Russie, Russell, <laughs> Russie, Russell Lafitte and uh, Corey Fleming. And so Alex Murdoch, uh, they were discussing his trial date earlier. And Harpootlian didn't want the trial to happen by the end of this year because that's what Creighton was pushing for. Um, so he was saying that, like, oh, how are we supposed to find a jury by then? Like, we all know about the jury tampering that happened with the court of clerks. So that was brought up uh, in court today. But Judge Newman is going to still have the trial happen. It's going to be November 27 of this year. That's going to be for the financial crimes. Um, they went into the Russell Lafitte stuff, but audio was really bad, so I skipped over it. But I think they were also trying to pick a um, trial date for Russell Lafitte as well. Right now, we're at Corey Fleming. Corey Fleming is the co-conspirator. Um, he was also he's also I think a lawyer as well. I think Corey Fleming. I think he was the lawyer that accompanied Alex Murdoch in one of the police interviews slash interrogations. Where I was like, man, who was that attorney friend of Alex Murdoch? He should have pulled his buddy out of there. Why were they sitting there doing this interview? I think that was Corey Fleming. I think. I'm not sure. If you guys remember, let me um, correct me. So right now we're doing the Corey Fleming sentence hearing because he was the one of the, he was like one of the first people that like admitted to all these um, financial crimes and stuff like that. So um alex murdoch russell lafitte not yet however russell lafitte has already been um formally charged and convicted i think of the federal financial crimes yeah there's just so many crimes going on it's just a lot <laughs> um however in regards to the potential um alex murdoch getting a new trial now apparently i think harpootlian said the attorney general it's going to be responding tomorrow. Well, that's the deadline for response. So we'll see tomorrow, I guess, to see if, you know, they're going to investigate into Rebecca Hill, the court of clerk, and then potentially get the members of the jury um, to testify under oath and, yeah, give their version of events and stuff like that. So we got a lot going on, and I could totally understand the, uh, the confusion. So right now we have, um, this is basically like essentially victim impact statements. 7227. It was just blatant thievery in, in open eyes of everybody except the two most important people that we work for, 
the clients. And what happens? Like Mr. Waters said, on October 12 of 2020, 17 months later, they decide we're going to cut some more checks. And you know what? We better get this case off the docket. So Mr. Fleming and Mr. Murdoch decide to sign a stipulation of dismissal. Mr. Murdoch had a lawyer, John Grantland, who represented an orderless insurance company. He wasn't contacted. Mr. Fleming knew that there was a lawyer involved, and they dismissed the case. Yet he sits on another $113,000 for another year, all the way up to the fall of 21, when he finally was caught, when I finally surfaced on September 7th with my partner, Ronnie Ricker. Now, I will say this. Of all the defendants that we got money for, and, and we can announce that we've recovered more than $7.5 billion from the Saturday Fields from a number of sources, Mr. Fleming was the first to come forward in the fall of 21. He did disgorge himself of the $680,000. His insurance company did pay the full value of his policy. He did finally disperse the remaining $113,000 in his trust account uh, to my clients. And uh, there was additional monies paid by his law firm. But the last thing I want to add, Your Honor, is he fought these charges. He wrote a letter to the Georgia Bar. Now, unlike our South Carolina Bar proceedings, the Georgia Bar proceedings are open. I was a complaining party because whenever I bring a claim against a lawyer for malfeasance or theft, I, it's my duty to notify the Bar. And so I notified South Carolina Bar and notified Georgia Bar. So I'm part of the process in Georgia. They, they, they want to hear from the complaining party. So when Mr. Fleming filed his response to the George Bar complaint, I got it. It was a 57-page uh, response that he did on the road. Uh -oh. to tell the truth, just like he's going to do when he stands before you today. Uh oh. You know what he told the George Bar? I was a victim of Alex Murdoch's death. I had no idea what he was doing. I was duped just like everybody else. I didn't understand how to do the structure like of Forge. Mr. Wooder shared with you that February 2017 letter. It was crystal clear. And you'd already done structures, but even if you haven't done structures, it says you can never get the check as the settling plaintiff lawyer. It's got to go from the paying insurance company to the annuity insurance company that's going to issue the structure. He already got the checks. Like Mr. Wooder said, Forge doesn't get money. They're a broker. You don't send money to Forge. It goes to an insurance company. Back. But in that 57-page response, he says, I had no idea what was going on. He didn't, you know what he said? I stole from my law partners. I didn't steal from the clients. When I stole those three checks of the 9500 the $8,500, the $9,000, I was stealing from my law partners. By the way, Judge, you read the rules of professional conduct, we don't have license to steal from our law partners either. That's another no-no. So I know you're a just judge. I watched you. I've watched you your entire career. I know how much you care about what our profession. I certainly know how much you care about our state. And this whole Murdoch, Fleming, Lafitte debacle has stained our state. And I'm going to leave with saying one thing. The hand of one is the hand of all. And Mr. Fleming is pleading guilty to every single charge, which means every single element of every single crime and every single fact that Mr. Waters has announced form the basis of those. So I ask you to do your, your duty to look at this as these are state court independent charges, not to look at what he's been sentenced in federal court, so that kind of takes care of it. These are claims that our citizens, the state of South Carolina, brought through a grand jury, advanced with our dollars through the South Carolina Attorney General. And I'm confident that the end, at the end, you will give that proportionate just sentence that deals with um, retribution to punish Mr. Fleming appropriately, but not overly so. Deterrence to tell me and every other lawyer, you cannot steal from your clients. Your duties are to your clients, not to yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, I, I think our final bigger presentation uh, before I conclude my initial remarks uh, comes from uh, Mr. Bamberg, who again represents uh, Pamela Pinckney. And I think it's important to point out uh, that while there has been a resolution in federal court, uh, that was only on an indicted Satterfield conduct because of the uh, statute of limitations there. Uh, and uh, I know that Mr. Uh, Bamberg will address, of course, that, that we are here today uh, for the first time for accountability as it relates to Ms. Pena. Mr. Bamberg, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Hello. Good morning, Ms. Is, is correct. Your Honor, is correct. Um, on behalf of Ms. Pena, uh, she wanted to be here. Uh, but she had a procedure on Monday, a medical procedure, and she's been dealing with a lot of pain since. 
Uh, so I'm here on her behalf. Um, and that really speaks to the, the type of people who are victimized. Um, we had to sit through a federal case through the United States of America's court system and hear about things that were done to the Satterfields. Um, and Ms. Pinkney, her family supports the Satterfields. Uh, what happened to Ms. Pinkney, what Mr. Fleming did to Ms. Pinkney was mentioned in the federal case. However, due to statute of limitations, she was not able to seek justice, criminal justice through that. Uh, that's what today is for. It's her first opportunity after well over a decade. Well, Your Honor, I want you to understand a little bit about what Ms. Pinkney went through. When we think about white collar crime, a lot of times people talk. Hey, Valerie, rewatch for the time of the trials directly affects where AM serves his sentences. He will prefer federal prisons. What has to do with that? Um. Federal. I mean, if he's already serving, let me think. If he's already serving in state prison for the murder trial, let's say that he pleads, um, because he is going to plead guilty for the federal one, wouldn't he still just stay in state prison? Unless, you know, if they can get the state one, the murder one, um, thrown out and then for a retrial, and then he goes to federal prison. Yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting thing. Yeah, I'm not really quite sure how that works. When you're charged for both a state crime and then like a federal crime, who decides where you go? About it as though it is victim bliss, that it just involves all my dollar and that's not the case. Uh, this was a horrendous accident. Uh, not only did Miss Pinkney shatter most of the bones in her body, there was a very extensive recovery process for her, uh, but she had to deal with injuries to other people that she cared about. For example, her niece, uh, who in addition to numerous physical injuries, lost the vision of one of her eyes. Um, and her son, Hakeem Pinkney. And Hakeem, um, Ms. Pinkney poured her soul into that young man. And he lost his hearing at three years old. Uh, he struggled with that. And she never gave up on him. She poured into him. Uh, he ended up graduating from the uh, South Carolina School for the Deaf and Blind. And shortly after graduating, he had all these dreams and ambitions. And during that accident, that fateful day, uh, this young man was rendered quadriplegic. He was unable to move anything uh, below his neck. He was on a ventilator to breathe from him, he relied on an, an electric machine to breathe from him. Um, and because he couldn't move, he couldn't sign language, and therefore he could not verbally communicate. Um, and she never gave up on him. Hakeem died, and it was very tragic. Uh, his ventilator was found unplugged. Uh, so, you know, and it's hard not to get teary eyed when you think about what he went through, but here's a young man who cannot hear, he cannot speak, he cannot move, and now he cannot breathe, and he can't tell anybody. He became a prisoner of his own body. And Ms. Pinkney was aware that that's how her son died. And instead of being a supportive lawyer, instead of showing compassion and care, empathy or sympathy, he could have said to this woman, I am so sorry for what you went through. I want to own up to the fact that I took some of your money. No, he didn't. In fact, they took the money and they flew to the College World Series to watch baseball. Meanwhile, this woman is still recovering. She's still dealing with the loss of her son. And no one cares. And I've said this before. Ms. Pinkney, myself, the Pinkney family, no one, everyone believes <coughs> that Mr. Fleming regrets everything that he did, not just to them, but to the Satterfield family over a decade later. Nobody doubts that he regrets it. It's hard to not regret your decisions when you're sitting there. I think everybody regrets that except complete sociopaths. We do not believe that he is remorseful for what he did. And there is a difference between I regret getting caught and getting in trouble and true remorse for what I did to you. When we hear these numbers, Your Honor, and we hear numbers like half a million dollars, we hear numbers like three million dollars, uh, we hear about total uh, amount of money stolen, we have to remember that where we come from, and myself, Ms. Pinkney, that I'm talking about geographically, uh, where we live, we're $8,000 check, $9,600 check, Yes, for privileged attorneys and others who either have been very blessed or very successful or work very hard to get there, it may not sound like a lot of money when you hear about $40 million you take. Minimum wage in our state, Your Honor, $15,850 if you're making minimum wage. That's how much you earn working for a year. Some of the money that Ms. Pinkney lost, 
she would have to work over half a year to earn and then pay taxes on it. This is not a small amount of money. This is not a victimless crime. Um, Your Honor, we trust the system. And I echo much of what Eric Bland said, that this was a black eye uh, to attorneys. It was a black eye to the legal profession. It was a black eye to our state. But it was a dagger in the heart of the clients who trusted their lawyers. Mr. Fleming knew he wasn't supposed to do it. We firmly believe, and I've had in-depth conversations with Ms. Pinkney about this, it wasn't until the federal government came, and now there was this window of opportunity to possibly serve a sentence in federal court, that Mr. Fleming was then willing to say, yes, I did X, Y, Z. Up to that, there was no, yes, Ms. Pinkney, I took your money. That wasn't represent, represented to the uh, ODC ethics, as you heard uh, Attorney Lane reference. It was denied, denied, denied. And one of the most difficult things for Ms. Pinkney and every other victim is having to know that you are truly a victim of bad acts from bad actors, and then hear those same bad actors who took bad acts say that they're a victim. It's demeaning, it reopens old wounds, and it's highly mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have Judge Newman, um, same judge from the murder trial. And in the world of white collar crime, Your Honor, if we talk about Wall Street, it's not necessarily people uh, stealing your money and you willingly give it to the investment bank. No one willingly gave Corey Fleming their money. He deceived them. He took it. You know, and I know that uh, there, there will be folks who will speak very positively about, about him. And we have no doubts that to a lot of people in his life and over the course of his life, Your Honor, he was an amazing person to them. He did do wonderful things to them. He was very giving to them. But he's not here today sitting in judgment of Your Honor for how good he was to everyone else. He's sitting in judgment for pleading guilty, element for element, <coughs> charge for charge, to how bad he was to Ms. Pinkney and Satterfield. And we would ask that uh, Your Honor take all of that into consideration. Um, this is their one chance after over a decade to get justice, Your Honor. And we ask that this court impose a sentence that uh, is not only sufficient to Again, punished Corey Fleming. He's been, and he's got a federal sentence again, but has nothing to do with Miss Pinkney. He has not been punished for that. Uh, we ask that you sentence uh, firmly uh, to not only punish him for that, but to also deter not just lawyers, but anybody who owes a fiduciary duty and people <laughs> rely on you. Don't steal from them. We're not expecting people to be perfect, but we are expecting you to be a decent human being. And if you're a lawyer and you take that oath that we all have to take, that you take that oath seriously. And it doesn't matter whether you personally have hard financial times or not. The saddest part, as an attorney who's got to know Ms. Pinkney, Your Honor, is knowing that even with the horrible death of her son, even with her own broken bones, her own medical bills, is that Corey Fleming needed money, Your Honor, and asked her, I guarantee you she would have gave it to him. That is the type of person Ms. Pinkney is, um, and that is who we victimized, Your Honor. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. you know, I just have a few more brief comments, and then I will uh, yield to the defense for their presentation again, but request the opportunity to speak and reply after they have presented. Um, Mr. Bamberg touched on this, and I know Your Honor has been presented a lot of letters, and I know that there's support out in the courtroom for people who have known Mr. Fleming. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry to them because they've been victimized by this too, because they have to be here. And they're put in this position. And I'm sorry that they have to go through this because I have a job to do. These people on our team have a job to do. The law enforcement officers here have a job to do. And the reality is, is that to be a con man, it depends on trust. It depends on reputation. It depends on the inherent credibility that comes with having a law license on your wall. It doesn't work otherwise. It depends on someone who doesn't have a prior record, which Mr. Fleming does. That's how con men work. That inherent trust and reputation is what they tread upon for this scheme. It doesn't work without all these good things that people are going to say that they believed about Mr. Fleming. It's the only way a con man can succeed is if people trust him. And they did. And he betrayed them. 
You might hear a little bit about the process, and you may hear essentially that the state, the Attorney General, the State Law Enforcement Division are being unreasonable because we refuse to accept and just check the box that Mr. Fleming was only doing 58. Instead, insisting because of the hard work that was done by all these folks to really dig deep and uncover the truth. The truth matters, Your Honor. The truth about what happened to the system matters. The fact that he was doing 90 miles an hour matters. It matters. It's not enough to just say, I did 58, and we say, okay, that's fine. We're done here. What really happened matters. When it affects the integrity of the system, when it was abuse of the system of the very courtroom in which we are in right now. Your Honor, independent accountability for his abuse of his state law license and state court actions is warranted in this case. Consecutive time is warranted. I wonder if he now regrets admitting to these crimes, if he should have just like <laughs> waited until trial with his buddies. Consecutive time is warranted for the extent of the reality of what Mr. Fleming did to the Satterfields exposed in this courtroom, the 90 miles an hour. Independent accountability is warranted for that. Above and beyond whatever was before. I'll give Mr. Fleming credit for pleading guilty, but he doesn't get credit for the delta, for the difference between 58 and 90 miles an hour. And his inability and refusal to admit to that, to only admitting to the most mitigating version of events that he can no longer deny because he's called red-handed, that only should get so much credit, Your Honor. And there needs to be independent accountability for the truth of what happened to the Sackfields above and beyond any other proceeding that has nothing to do with what happened here or what this proceeding was. Independent accountability is warranted for panel opinion. So as Mr. Bamberg said, has convictions relating to the conduct victimizing her in this court. And while you may hear that in another proceeding they roll that into a PSR, that's not the same thing. And we don't even get that. I don't know what's in that thing. It doesn't matter, though. A lawyer should not get one-stop shopping for victimizing multiple clients over the course of a decade. It's not buy one, get one free. There should be <laughs> independent accountability here today, consecutive accountability for Ms. Painting. He should not get buy one, get one free. And independent accountability is, again, warranted for the state judicial system itself. It must defend itself and have its own independent accountability and not allow someone, when the state is unhappy with 58 miles an hour, to just make a deal and that be the end of it. So, again, he was the first person to plead guilty to these um, financial crimes. However... His excuse was that he didn't know to what extent Alex Murdoch was doing this. Or like, I, I think he said like, oh, like, like this all started because of Alex Murdoch. But then they later found out that he was a more participant than what he originally stated. And he was stealing checks way back since 2012. So that's why the state is going hard at him, even though he pled guilty. And even though he was the first person to come out and admit to these crimes. I ask your honor for consecutive sentencing. I ask your honor that even if you run sentencing for the Satterfields concurrent to anything else that happened, that any sentence for the Pinkneys be consecutive. I ask your honor not to let Mr. Fleming. So consecutive versus like concurrent. If you're sentenced to like, maybe like, let's say you get 10 years for Satterfield, 10 years for, um, for Ms. Pinkney, right? Um, concurrent would be like, you do basically a summation of 20 years total. So 10 years first for Satterfield and then 10 years afterwards for Ms. Pinkney. If it was concurrent, you would be serving for Satterfield and Ms. Pinckney at the same time. So it would just be a total of 10 years, even though you're getting 10 years for both of them. So he's asking for a concurrent. So he wants it to be sort of individually for each of the victims. Who I think we have established does not completely come clean with the reality of his behavior and only admitted to what he's admitting to now because he got caught red-handed. <laughs> well, what is his exposure for in the uh, Pinckney case and the... Satterfield case. Stand by, Your Honor. So the total exposure uh, between the two is 195 years. Oh, man. And fines up to over to $8,090,863.90 plus discretionary fines. Um, Your Honor, if we look at the Satterfield crimes, count 10 is a criminal conspiracy, which is 0 to 5. 
We have three counts of insurance fraud, $50,000 or more, which is zero to 10, plus fines of 20,000 to 100,000. Counts 13, 17, 21, and 30 are breach of trust with fraudulent intent, 10,000 or more, which are zero to 10, plus fine in the discretion of the court. <laughs> counts 14, 18, and 22, value of money laundering, value $100,000 or more, carry a potential sentence of up to 20 years, Your Honor, and a fine not to exceed, and or a fine not to exceed $250,000. Counts 23, 25, and 27 are breach of trust with fraudulent intent, value 2,000 to 10,000. That's zero to five, plus fine in the discretion. Counts 24, 26, and 28, three counts of money laundering, value more, value 300 to 20,000, which is zero to five, and or fine not to exceed 250,000 or twice the value of the transactions. And then count 29 is computer crime, value more than 10,000, which is a zero to five, and or fine not more than 50,000. Um, Your Honor, that is the Satterfield case. Hmm, For the Pandy case, 2022 GS 4702, Again, both of these indicted by the state grand jury back in early 2022. We have counts five and nine, which are breach of trust with fraudulent intent, 2,000 to 10,000, which are zero to five plus fine in the discretion or fine in the discretion. Counts. You say zero to? Zero to five or fine or fine in the discretion for that one, Your Honor. Count six, breach of trust, 2,000 or less. That's actually a 30 day offense, Your Honor. Or a fine, not more than 1,000. That would have been one of the crossman checks, which was like 1400 bucks. Count seven, which is criminal conspiracy, that's zero to five. And count eight, breach of trust 10,000 or more, which is zero to 10 for five years discretion. Oh Again, the state would submit that no matter how you stack them, even if you run certain ones together, that there needs to be independent consecutive accountability from one, from one to the other. And that there needs at a minimum to be a lead sentence for the Satterfields and a consecutive lead sentence for the Patriots. So that Mr. Fleming, for decades, almost a decade's worth of conduct, doesn't get buy one, get one free. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, guys. Ms. Barbier. All right. Defense term. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Yes, ma'am. Your Honor is aware that um, on August 21st, I filed with the court an initial sentencing memorandum. And in that sentencing memorandum, laid out for Your Honor some of the background of the investigation, joint and federal investigation, and then also um, talked a lot about Mr. Fleming's life, um, his community involvement, um, the things that uh, bring him to you today as a whole person to, for, to look at. Um, and then, Your Honor, following the guilty plea, uh, which is when we heard a lot of the same information that we heard today from Mr. Um, Waters. On September 12th, we filed a supplemental sentencing memorandum. And in that sentencing memorandum, um, we addressed a few of the factual uh, issues that we had some discrepancies with. And then yesterday, I received a response from the state. And I want to thank the state because um, they responded very quickly. And I think that what I gleaned from their memorandum is there's, there's very little that we disagree with in terms of uh, the responses they made to our sentencing memorandum. Um, first, Your Honor, I took issue with the fact that they said that Mr. Fleming had invited Mr. Satterfield into his office and changed the personal representative um, execution forms. I pointed out this, the evidence simply doesn't support that, and Mr. Waters agrees with that. And um, not, we're not saying it's material to his guilt, but we wanted to point that out because it was factually inaccurate. Um, okay. Secondly, Your Honor, with respect to the, the caption that was created on the stipulation of dismissal, the petition and the order, that was not done by Mr. Fleming. Again. That's not material to his guilt, but it's something that, you know, I wanted to point out for the court was not accurate. Um, regarding the check that was written on the, on the Pinckney settlement proceeds, the $89,000 check, Mr. Waters stated during his plea um, factual basis that that had been made out to Ellick personally. It was not. It was made out to the Murdoch firm at that time. Um, again, that's not necessarily material to his guilt, but that was a, a factual inaccuracy that we wanted to point out. Most importantly, Your Honor, and I appreciate the state's candidness with the court on this issue. Um, they, right out of the gate in their sentencing memorandum, said, and I'm quoting them because I don't want to misspeak on their behalf, they said the state does not allege that Fleming necessarily knew the specific particulars of Murdaugh's fake forge account or that Murdaugh intended to steal all of the money given to him. Indeed, the state has consistently accepted that Fleming might not have expected Murdaugh to steal all of the money. And that's an important fact to Mr. Fleming, Your Honor. That's an important fact that he wants you to know, and that 
again was reiterated today by Mr. Waters in his, um, his closing argument or his fact, whatever it, you want to call it, that he, that he made today. And so we appreciate um, those two concessions. That's, those are very important for um, Mr. Fleming to have on the public record, both for him um, and, you know, for his um, friends and supporters to understand. And so I, I appreciate the state's response and the, the prompt response of that nature. Um, with respect to the forge issue, Your Honor, I know that Mr. Bland and, and Mr. Waters have made a lot of comments about what Mr. Fleming definitely knew or should have known or did know and what he did. We pointed out in our sentencing memorandum a couple of things that I think um, would be good to reiterate at this time. Um, Your Honor's heard, I'm sure, a lot about Forge from the other trial that you had and from the information um, in that trial that was put forth about Forge Consulting. Um, Your Honor's probably aware that the fake Forge account was created in September of 2015, which is years before the Satterfield case came to, to be. Um, the account was started at Bank of America, and it was titled Alexander Murdoch DBA Forge. Uh, the account clearly had no affiliation with the real, real Forge Consulting. But Mr. Murdoch was the only authorized signer on that account. Um, he's the only one that had access to it. He's the only one on the signature card. And unbeknownst to Mr. Fleming and to a lot of other people, a lot of other people that Your Honor himself heard from during that murder trial, um, good people, um, people that had known Mr. Fleming, I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Murdoch for 40 years. And the crux of the testimony, Your Honor, and I don't, I don't have to tell you because you had, you had front seat um, to that trial, but the crux of that testimony was that Mr. Murdoch habitually lied to everyone in his personal and professional life. Okay. He lied extensively to his law partners, to his accounting department, his CFO, his family, his office manager, mm -hmm. his banks, his creditors, his opposing counsel, to judges, and court personnel. And Your Honor, during this time period, I think it should go it, it be known, Mr. Murdoch was the president of the Trial Lawyers Association. He was a, a by, you know, many accounts, a respected member of the bar, and um, a lot of people, including Mr. Fleming, were stunned to find out that he had been um, stealing millions of dollars, diverting it into this fake forge account. Uh, Ms. Seconder, I, I, I recall, her testimony was that the firm had these checks being written to forge okay. for years out of their trust account. And they didn't know he was stealing. Um, there were the bank statements from the fake Forge account were in Mr. Murdoch's office. No one caught that. No one caught the fact that these checks were coming back with his individual signature on it. Um, Mr. Fleming never saw those types of checks come through his office. Um, you know, I cited to the, the testimony of Mr. Cope, a partner at the Murdoch firm, who recounted the story of when he told Mr. Fleming about this fake Forge account and about what had transpired at the firm and about the fact that they had caught Mr. Murdoch stealing money from the firm. And I cited to you, you know, his, his testimony, and the, and the crux of his testimony was that Mr. Fleming immediately brought up the Satterfield case. He was calling him about a completely different matter. Mr. Fleming's the one who brought up the Satterfield case and said, oh my God, oh my God, we, we had the Forge account in the Satterfield case and it was for millions. And Mr. Cope's clear impression was that Mr. Fleming was shell-shocked. And I say this, Your Honor, and I give you this information, not to minimize or downplay or, or excuse any conduct of Mr. Fleming, okay, because what we are here today for is a sentencing. As Your Honor knows, Mr. Fleming has pled guilty to each and every count that he's been charged with. That doesn't happen very often. He pled guilty to, you know, all of the conduct in federal court, and he's pled guilty in this court to the conduct. And so he's not here to make excuses for himself or to call himself a victim or to place the blame on anybody's shoulders other than his own. But I have to take issue with the theme of Mr. Waters' closing argument during this, this, these, this, this process here. He's, he says that Mr. Guilty, Mr. Fleming's guilty plea is the equivalent of pleading guilty to speeding at the rate of 58 miles an hour in a 55 mile zone when he's really going 90. And I have to say with all due respect, this analogy is a gross mischaracterization of Mr. Fleming's guilty plea and the illegal conduct that he has fully acknowledged. He has pled, he's pled guilty to each and every count in state and federal court, and that's a total of 24 felony counts, and that's hardly a speeding ticket. And he has not run away from his guilt in this case, not in any way whatsoever. He has, um, as Mr. Waters would have you believe, he, he's not run away, he has confronted his actions, he has stepped up to the plate, he has fully acknowledged that he was wrong, that he committed illegal acts, and that he is guilty. And he can only give this court and he can only give the government mm -mm, never the facts as he knows them. That's it. 
He can't make things up about himself or other people. Um, he can't say things that aren't true. He has acknowledged his guilt there. And as your honors aware, that that is not the case in, in most cases. In most cases, first of all, people aren't always prosecuted in both state and federal court, um, even when there's concurrent jurisdiction. You know, many times one prosecuting entity defers to the other. Um, that's true. I wonder how long it took for him to plead guilty to all this. I'm sure I can probably Google and find out. Does anyone here know? Generally, the normal course of business, your honor was a prosecutor. I was a prosecutor. That happens all the time. And that's not the case here. And I'm not here to complain about that. And we're not here to complain and we're not here to subscribe any kind of motive to those decisions. But what I do know is this. I know that the South Carolina Attorney General's Office and the United States Attorney's Office share the exact same goals. And those, the primary goals of those offices are, number one, to protect the public. Yes, the banana and the two, duct tape. to promote respect for the rule of law. And number three, to defer and deter future misconduct. And also, in the end, to ensure that a punishment that is sufficient but not greater than necessary is imposed. And I, w I submit to Your Honor that all of these goals are accomplished in a concurrent sentence. Um, no individual, no individual should be forced to serve two separate sentences for the exact same illegal conduct. And I want to address a matter that um, Mr. Bamberg and Mr. Waters have both raised um, regarding the Pinckney matter. The Pinckney matter was fully included in the state sentence, and, Ms. and Judge Gergel made that extremely clear. It was included in the loss calculations. They were notified under the Mandatory Victims Act. They, their, the loss amounts were included in the loss calculations. The restitution was ordered on the Pinckney case. Ms. Pinckney and Mr. Bamberg were, were available to speak at the sentencing. They attended all the, the hearings that I'm aware of, and they've been given uh, treatment just as any other victim in federal court. So that matter has been heard, and it, has, it, it wasn't litigated because Mr. Fleming acknowledged his guilt in those matters. And so there, this idea that justice hasn't been served in that case, I find, you know, I, I take issue with that because it has. I mean, you don't order restitution in a case unless there's findings made and unless they are considered victims in the case and unless that conduct was folded into the sentence created um, by Judge Gergel. And, and so, Your Honor, what I would submit is that the desire to pursue dual prosecutions, is, it's, it's within the discretion of these uh, prosecuting bodies, but it also, that desire still has to be tempered by the rule of law. And justice, I would submit, is not served for South Carolinians or defendants by obtaining multiple convictions in a, in a high profile case and requiring a man to serve two separate sentences for the same offenses. And that, Your Honor, is consistent with the rule of law. I would, I would submit, Your Honor, victims. that, and, and there's been a lot of talk about this involves a state license and a state court system and state judges, and I don't disagree with any of that. Of course it does. I mean, that's why we're here, because Mr. Fleming has admitted guilt in that. But when you look to, you know, who the, the, the United States Attorney's Office and the Attorney General's Office, who, who they serve, they serve the public. And it's, it's not two separate publics, it is the public. And I don't even say it's to the citizens of South Carolina, because they serve the non-citizens too. Um, they serve everybody. And so, I don't, I don't understand the division that's being tried to create here with respect to, you know, justice can only be done here in, in this courtroom. Of course, this courtroom plays an integral role in serving um, justice. But Your Honor, um, I believe, understands that the role uh, that these prosecutors have and the role that the other prosecutors have are, are the same. And they generally work as a team and they generally work to um, the, same, the same ends, and that is that to see justice served. If you look to the American Bar Association's standards on who the client of the prosecutor is, there's a section, and it's in a, it's in a publication they put out called the um, Criminal Justice Standards for the Prosecution Function. And it says the client of the prosecutor is the public. And it's not any particular government agency, law enforcement officer, or unit, or witness, or victim. When investigating or prosecuting a criminal matter, the prosecutor does not represent law enforcement personnel who've worked on the matter, and such law enforcement personnel, they're not the prosecutor's clients. The client is the public for both prosecuting entities. So, Your Honor, I would submit that in these proceedings, you know, Mr. Mr. those purposes are being served. And I don't take any issue with the representation that the Attorney General's office has made that they have been a central role in this case and that SLED's been a central role. I, I, I wouldn't, um, wouldn't dare to endeavor to do that, Your Honor. Everybody has an important role in this process, and certainly the Attorney General's Office and SLED has too. And, and from my understanding, from all the press releases that have come out from both bodies, they have 
embraced the idea that this was a joint investigation and there were joint efforts by everybody involved, all the agencies involved, to bring this case to justice. And, Your Honor, I would like to take some time to talk about Mr. Fleming um, and his, his life before this, his family, his, his community, many of whom are here today. You've got a packed courtroom. And I, I would submit, Your Honor, that doesn't happen every day, as Your Honor might um, be aware. I think that Mr. Fleming is, is overwhelmed, and he knows how lucky he is and how grateful he is to have the support of so many people. And, and contrary to what Mr. the comment Mr. Waters made, they're not here because they have to be. They're here because they want to be. They're here because, you know, they understand that Mr. Fleming made some terrible decisions. They understand that this has forever changed the course of his life. But they are forgiving and they are supportive. And I think it's it's a beautiful. Is it because they didn't have any money stolen from them by Corey Fleming? <laughs> I mean, if he didn't steal money from me, then yeah, maybe I'd be more inclined to forgive him. Unless these are victims of his and they're forgiving and they're willing to speak on his behalf. We'll see. Thing to see, I, I believe. But Your Honor, um, I want to take a, just a brief opportunity to introduce you to Mrs. Fleming. She's here. Um, All right, wife, been I guess. For 25 years. Um, she's seated in the courtroom in the front room. His parents are also here. They're Caroline and Frank Koslick and Astor and Catherine Fleming. You want them to stand so I'll know who you're talking about? Sure. Okay. If you all would stand, I would appreciate it. So in, on the far right, we have Eve Fleming. Um, Ms. Fleming's also a member of the bar. She's a public defender here in, in this area and has worked with juveniles her career. Um, and then we have um, Mr. Fleming and his wife, um, uh, uh, Catherine. And then we've got Caroline and Frank Koslick, um, Mr. Fleming's mom and, and stepfather. And so, um, you know, not only have these friends and supporters and this family been here today, they were here. A lot of them came to his guilty plea in Williamsburg County, um, and a lot of them came to his federal proceedings as well. So it's just, it's a very, um, I can tell you Mr. Fleming is, is, is overwhelmed with gratitude for that and, and, and doesn't necessarily believe that he's deserving of it, but is extremely grateful. Mr. Fleming also has two children. They are not here today. One's in college, and Mr. Fleming felt that it would be better for him to continue his studies and, and focus on school than he came to the federal plea, and so he's not leaving school to come to this. Um, his daughter just started a, a job with the Department of Defense. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Um, his daughter's not here today. She's overseas. She's just started a new job, just graduated from college. Mr. Fleming's very proud of her. They, they all are. Um, she was at his federal plea. Um, and so, you know, I can tell you that the friends and supporters that he have, um, and we've, we've talked about this in our sentencing memorandum, but I think that um, it sheds a lot of light on his unique personal history and characteristics because this is his community and they're here for him. Um, he's had some extraordinary good works. And, um, and so I want to take a few moments to talk about that, um, just to give you some additional insight. Um, and I want to, to make sure, Your Honor, that I preface these comments by saying nothing that I'm going to say or that his supporters are going to say about him and about um, why we're here today is meant to diminish um, his acknowledgement of his guilt or his acknowledgement of the wrongfulness of what he did. He, he, Mr. Fleming acknowledges the seriousness of his actions. Um, he feels nothing but remorse. And, and he has expressed that remorse on multiple occasions, but he specifically did it at the guilty, the sentencing hearing in federal court, and he's going to do it again today, Your Honor. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sorry that there are some that don't believe his, his sincere remorse. I think, you know, Your Honor can be the judge of that. I know that when Judge Gergel listened to his remarks and to the remarks of the people that spoke, he did believe that he was remorseful. Um, and, you know, it's, it's going to be really hard for me to talk about Corey Fleming's life um, and do a better job of describing him than the people who have written you letters. And I know Your Honor has um, received a lot of letters. Um, people are still writing me letters. As of yesterday, I was, I was getting new letters. Um, they keep coming in, Your Honor, and I think that's a testament to how strongly people feel about Mr. Fleming. Um, and a lot of these people have a different story about how Mr. Fleming has made an impact on their lives how he helped them, how he was there from them when, when they were in need. Um, they're written, they're letters that are written by people from all walks of life. Um, some are live in this Beaufort community and some are from far away. Um, and some are from our older citizens and some are from very young adults. And some are from his peer group and his former colleagues. And you know, these people aren't all people that know each other, but they all have stories about Mr. Fleming. And I would submit to you that there are a couple of common themes that run throughout these letters. The first observation that I had 
when I read these letters was that, you know, it, it sort of was in keeping with the theory that I've had since, since I was a judicial law clerk. And that is that you can tell a lot about someone from how they treat the courthouse staff and the, court and the, the non-lawyers in our system. Um, you've received a lot of letters from some of those people. Um, and they talk about the Corey Fleming that they know. And, and those people include, you know, a bailiff um, and, and somebody who worked in the clerk's office, people who have worked at the solicitor's office with him, um, a retired state trooper and a court security officer who said that there are not enough accolades in the English language to describe his personality and character. You know, there are several letters from people who worked as his paralegal. Um, there are, there's an, a letter from an agent with the South Carolina Department of Probation and Parole who's known Mr. Fleming for 30 years. And she describes him as, quote, a wonderful human being. Um, she says his character, his work ethic, and behavior over the course of our personal and professional relationship has been above reproach, and his dedication to serving the community and his clients has been inspiring to witness. And, you know, Your Honor, in addition to the courthouse, the, the letters that I have received from the court personnel, I've also gotten a chance to personally observe uh, people who um, have interacted with Mr. Fleming when I have gone court with him. And this is before he was in custody, obviously, and even, you know, after he's been in custody. But there have been just a, a number of people who've approached me and who've approached him to just say, you know, that they were praying for him and that they were thinking of him and, and had nothing but good things to say about Mr. Fleming. And so what this tells me about Mr. Fleming is that, you know, for decades, he has treated all of the people who play a unique and important role in our court system with the utmost respect, kindness, and professionalism. And I, the second theme that I see emerging from these letters is that, you know, I think you can tell a lot about a lawyer from the way he treats young lawyers. And, you know, there are a lot of letters that Your Honor has received from people who knew Mr. Fleming when they were a young lawyer. I remember being a young lawyer. It's scary. You don't know what you're doing. It's intimidating. I don't know. I feel like she needs to focus on like, did he try to give the money back before he was caught? Was he trying to pay some of the victims back? Like, I don't know. There needs to be a focus on that. Because obviously after you're caught, I mean, <laughs> I don't really give a fuck about anything afterwards. Um, but before he was caught, what, what was he like? Not just with other people, but like, was he trying to get these like victims their money back did he yeah i don't know like are there exchanges in emails or texts where he like actually felt bad and he was like desperate or something or was it just a greedy ass person who was just nice to other people um, but many of these people talk about they talk a great deal about how mr fleming would step in and help you know they when they were first starting he <laughs> Corey's such a great guy no i think you should say he stole money from needy people and gave it to greedy people. He saw them in court. He understood <laughs> they, they didn't know how to do something. He gave them guidance. He gave them advice. You know, he helped them through a hearing. Um, he was never too busy to assist and offer advice. He said, they say when, he, when, he, when they needed something, he, they could stop by his office. And, you know, he was never too busy. He would take the time to introduce them to people while he was at the courthouse or at a bar function. Um, you know, he made them feel welcome. They also talk about Mr. Fleming's selfless acts of kindness and helping people um, who were in the courtroom who didn't have a lawyer because they couldn't afford one, and he helped him anyway. And you know, Mr. Fleming wasn't writing down these hours to try to get pro bono you know, lawyer hours or become you know, known as a pro bono lawyer. He's doing it just simply to help people that needed help. Um, some of the letters talk about the fact that if the bar had a fundraiser, you know, Mr. Fleming was the first to, to, to volunteer his time you know, to help. Um, they let, the letters describe Mr. Fleming as a lawyer who would stay involved in his clients' lives. Um, he'd help them get jobs. He lent them a car, uh, mentored their children. The list goes on. One letter notes that he's represented the families and the victims of violent crimes free of charge many times during his career, and that he would go above and beyond to help these people through that process for, for no compensation, only because he knew, and having had a wife who was a public defender, he knew you know, what that's like, what it, what it uh, means to be in that system. Um, and I do want to quote one letter, Your Honor, from one member of the bar. He said, I do believe at worst Corey is a good and decent man who succumbed to a very unfortunate lapse of judgment for which he has already paid very dearly. Hi, Jenny. Um, so the judge is lenient in his sentencing. But Your Honor, I would submit to you that all of the good things that Mr. Fleming did for the legal profession in South Carolina over 29 years, you must also take that into account when fashioning your sentence. And I know that, um, you know, Your Honor has has been sentencing people a long time. I know that it's probably a very difficult part of your job. Um, and I know that you take genuine care in doing this, but- Did you progress in Baldur's Gate, Jenny? When you sentence someone, you sentence someone as a whole person. And when you look at their, Mr. Fleming's life outside of the practice of the law, there's another theme that runs through it. And that is service to his community, service to others. Some of these letters talk about Mr. Fleming 
and his, you know, his life as a neighbor, his life as a landlord, someone they knew from the YMCA, who he was very active in getting um, built in, in this, this county, um, his church. And you look at what they say about Mr. Fleming. They say that he's the guy that comes over at the crack of dawn on Christmas morning when your pipes are broken. Um, he's the guy that helps you move in on the day your moving truck pulls in and then brings you dinner. Um, they talk about the guy that helped with home improvement projects and never asked for anything in return. Um, he's the guy that made sure you had a ride home from the hospital after you had a stroke. These are all from the letters, Your Honor. Um, he's the guy who cried with you when he discovered that your mom had Alzheimer's and then took the time to take your mom to lunch the next day to make sure he was spending some time with her. Um, you know, there's, there's somebody that uh, some of the letters talk about uh, a man that Mr. Fleming discovered was homeless and how he helped him find a place to live and has helped him get work. Um, you know, his, the woman who cleaned his house for years talked about um, how he treated her like family and invited her and her family to share holidays with them. And so, Your Honor, the I mean, maybe he's one of those people who steal from others, and in order to balance that guilt out, he's extremely nice to people that he actually cares about. But if he don't care about you, you know, he might steal from you. The stories, <laughs> they go on and on about the help that in the, in the community that Mr. Fleming has served for so many years. One of the things that's... I, I think it's a different story if this is like a one-time thing, lapse of judgment. But this is something that's spanned, according to Crit and Waters, 10 years, 10 fucking years. That's, that's, that's tough to overlook. Stands out to me are the single parents that Mr. Fleming has helped. I mean, they talk about the fact that, you know, he did work around their house. Um, he spent time with their children because they didn't have a father. Um, you know, one woman said, who was an 18 year old single mother when she met the Flemings. Said, it's not about who you were in public, it's about who you were in private, no one's watching. That Corey, quote, changed the trajectory of my life. Mm. And he changed the trajectory of my 22-year-old daughter's life. He invited her to a playgroup, befriended her. He drove her daughter to school for 15 years, lent her a car when she needed it, invited them on fun outings, and made them feel like a part of the community. Another person, Or maybe, you know, he was a good person, and at some point he just became really greedy. You know? It's unfortunate, but it fucking happens. That you're going to hear from today, who was not at the federal sentencing, but who has come a long way to be here today, is Ms. Ballou. She was another single mother who rented a house from the Flemings, and, and she's going to talk about how she was treated by them, by Mr. Fleming in particular. Um, you know, the fact that when she needed help, when she couldn't make ends meet, he was there for her and didn't require her to pay rent. Um, when she talked about when, his, when her son got in trouble, you know, he was there for her son. Um, so she's going to hear, she's here today, and she's going to address the court. Some of the other letters talk about Mr. Fleming being like a parent to many of his children's friends. Um, you know, there's one couple, um, and it's, there's a, their, their children's friends were in their early 20s, and they, they thought, I thought this letter was so insightful, wishing, written by somebody that young. And she said, I wish that you know that Corey is so much more than this gross era of judgment. Corey is the type of person who treats strangers like friends and friends like family. I have witnessed countless examples of kindness and generosity towards others, organizations, and their families. So what I would submit to your honor, unlike, um, the, the picture that Mr. Waters has painted for you, that Mr. Fleming was using his, um, you know, his goodness to, to, for evil. What this reveal, what these letters reveal, and what these people are going to tell you is that over his lifetime, Mr. Fleming has demonstrated the fundamental values that sustain a community. Another constant thing about Mr. Fleming is him as a father, him as a husband, and as a son. And in most every single one of the letters, because most everybody that knows Mr. Fleming knows that his family is the most important thing in his life, um, his family and his faith. Um, they all describe him as a devoted family person, loving, caring, present, and someone who sets an example for other peoples in the community about his treatment of his family and his parenting skills. And, you know, Your Honor, this is, I think, as Your Honor knows, all of these cases, and, and in every case, whether it's white collar or whether it's, you know, any kind of criminal case, it's always hard on the family. And, um, you know, I think that if there's any solace that Mr. Fleming takes in, in the decision that he's, that he's had to make here, which is to, to own up to his guilt, um, it is that he's demonstrating for his children what you do when you make a mistake. You know, you step up, you own it. And it's also what the motive is for, too, like what he was using the money for. If it was like, oh, my God, you know, he went broke, his wife had cancer, he was like stealing or borrowing money from the clients to pay for a treatment. Like it really depends on what he used the money for. Like, yeah, you shouldn't do it anyways. But I mean, was he just using the money and just padding his like comfortable lifestyle? 
Like, what was, what was going on here? And you admit you were wrong. And that's what he's done. And that's what he hopes his children gets out of this. Because what he has done is try to do everything human possibly to right the wrong here. Yeah, after he was um, caught. You, know, you heard from Mr. Um, Bland that he was the first person to step up and return every bit of the legal fee that his firm took in the Satterfield matter. Mm -hmm. um, he's been the first person in this matter to plead guilty, period, and to own up to what he's done. Yeah, children are in college right now. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry that that was issued to his firm, that the, 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 the total fee, $672,000, went to Moskun and Fleming, and then it was split. So, yes, that, that was all returned, Your Honor, in that case. But Mr. Fleming acknowledges his guilt, obviously, in the role he played in, in, uh, in getting that fee. Um, but, Your Honor, um, he, has, he has stepped up, and this has been a very, obviously, a, a very challenging period in his life. Um, the thing that his friends and his supporters and, and people know about him, though, is that he, they believe, and I believe, have faith that he will learn and he will grow from this experience, and he will come out of this better and stronger. And that's the point of, you know, of punishment. Part of that is rehabilitation. And I would submit to you, Your Honor, that that's already started occurring. When Mr. Fleming's law license was suspended, um, he didn't curl up in a ball and lie in bed, okay? He didn't you know, portray that he was bitter or angry at the world. What he did was started working for Habitat for Humanity. Um, you know, he's very skilled in um, construction, and he immediately began volunteering his time there because he thought it was the one thing that, you know, he was determined to be productive and determined to be useful in his community and to do something that he could put his skills to work and help other people. And you got a letter from somebody at Habitat for Humanity um, who said um, that Mr. Fleming brought kindness, talent, and humor to the worksite. And what I would say about that, Your Honor, is that this speaks volumes about Mr. Fleming, because if you're able to bring kindness and talent and humor to others during the worst period of your life, that's pretty some, that's, that's something else. Um, you know, I, I would just submit to you, Your Honor, that these letters, you know, as a whole, collectively, they're, they're remarkable. And I, and I think, and I, I, I've told, I told Judge Gurgle this, and, and I'll tell you, Mr. Fleming's never read these letters. And I didn't know these stories about Mr. Fleming until I read the letters, because he's never you know, he'd never told me about some of these relationships or some of the people that he'd helped through these things. Um, but he's never read the letters because, you know, it's very difficult for him to think about the fact of how many people he's disappointed in this case. Um, but what we do know, Your Honor, what I, what I know and what um, his family and friends know is that at the heart of this, um, he's a good person who made some very bad decisions. And we know that. We know from our experience that good people do make bad decisions, but I would submit to you, Your Honor, that we are all better than the worst thing that we've ever done. Um, you know, and I want to say for a minute, um, Mr. Bland mentioned the Georgia Bar and the very beginning. Also, I don't think she's going to speak for the victims. I think the, sorry, not the victims. I, I think um, his supporters are going to speak for themselves. So I don't know, man. I feel like if I was speaking for him, you're stealing my thunder right now, lady. You're already previewing everything I'm going to say. But I don't know, maybe she's just giving like a brief generalization of what they're going to say. And then we're going to have like a couple people make their statements. I, I don't know. I, I feel like we should just have them make their statements, I guess. But we'll see. ...of this process. And what Your Honor is probably aware of, having, having been a prosecutor, having been in the system for a long, long time. statement. Mr. Fleming's not unlike 99.9% .9 of the people um, that I've seen over 30 years in these situations. And, and he didn't fully come to terms with what he had done immediately. He admitted to some ethical violations, but he did not admit to his criminal conduct initially. Um... But, you know, he made a decision, um, and it was a decision made this year, to hold himself fully accountable for his actions. And, and simply because, not because, the, the, as Mr. Bamberg put, the, the feds came and knocking. The, Mr. Mr. Fleming's been aware since the very beginning of this that this was a joint federal and state investigation. So it's always been, feds have always been involved. There was never any um, surprise there. But he decided, Your Honor, that he was going to cooperate and he was going to um, plead guilty. And he wasn't made any promises. He was not, he didn't receive any deals. There's no deal. You know, he pled guilty in federal court and his sentence was calculated by the sentencing guidelines. Um, it, like I said, it included both the Satterfield and the Pinckney matters. And, and Judge Gurgle sentenced him pursuant to those guidelines. There was no variance. There was no downward departure. There was no um, stipulation of a sentence. He, he took 
the sentence that was within the guideline range, and he didn't know what that guideline range would be when he pled guilty, and he had no idea what would happen or transpire in state court. But at the end of the day, he made a decision to have faith in this system. And to... <laughs> She's making me space out. I'll try to pay attention, but I'm also spacing out as well. Respect, <laughs> like, his, has been his experience and his, and his wife's experience in, in the judicial system for a long time, that he would be treated fairly. And that's all he's asked for, Your Honor. That's all he asked for today. Okay. Um, I would submit to you that he has accepted responsibility for his conduct. Um, he did not put either the state or the federal government through lengthy litigation or a trial. We didn't come here today to quabble about trial date. Um, we came here today to fully acknowledge the illegal conduct to which he engaged. Um, I know that I've provided Your Honor with um, a transcript from his federal plea. I think it's very, very clear um, in that proceeding, in addition to this proceeding, that he has, um, he has acknowledged his, his illegal conduct. And not only that, that he is deeply remorseful for his actions. And he appreciates the fact that his actions have impacted innocent people. And that's, that's, one of, that's the reason he pled guilty. And I will say he, he is extremely, extraordinarily grateful to the Pinckneys and to the Satterfields for their grace. You know, during the federal um, sentencing hearing, they, they said they forgave him. They said that again today. Um, that's hugely meaningful to him. And um, I, I don't think they'll ever understand how meaningful that is. So we appreciate that, and we appreciate um, the gracious manner in which they've handled this. So, Your Honor, I, I would say that Mr. Fleming has suffered, um, and he has um, paid a very, very dear price in this, in this proceeding and in um, the other federal proceeding that would discourage him from ever, ever engaging in similar conduct. And, and I believe, strongly believe, that Mr. Fleming will serve one day um, as a very important person who can share his story um, with other lawyers as a cautionary tale, um, <laughs> with just other people. And, th and that in and of itself, Your Honor, will promote deterrence. Mr. Fleming will be a martyr one day. Don't worry, Judge. He will be. Um, I believe that he, the, the tremendous consequences that he has felt um, in his professional life, he is, he is. He's oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. That actually makes it out. Give me a second. You guys remember this game, by the way? Anyone? I'd like to have a quick chat about Ski Free. Or Ski Free? Ski Free is a game developed by Chris Perry. I hate, I hate it, Ski Free. Sorry, I accidentally exited out. Um, hold on, give me a second. Second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, I think she's wrapping up with the end of her speech, and then we'll have the um, people will actually speak. As um, he has acknowledged his, his illegal conduct, and not only that, that he is deeply remorseful for his actions. Oh, and right he appreciates here. the fact that his actions have impacted innocent people. And that's, that's, one of, that's the reason he pled guilty. And I will say he, he is extremely, extraordinarily grateful to the Pinckneys and to the Satterfields for their grace. You know, during the federal um, sentencing hearing. Mm -hmm. It was on PC. I hated that game because when you would ski down, sorry, when you would ski down, um, I think like there would be like a bear or something or a monster that would just like come out of nowhere and attack you and kill you. So you can never finish the damn game. It was they, rigged. They said they forgave him. They said that again today. Um, that's hugely meaningful to him. And um, I, I don't think they'll ever understand how meaningful that is. So we appreciate that. And we appreciate. Um, they said that they're Christians and they, you know, they usually, uh, I, what did they say again? They're like, we're Christians, you know, we like forgive. But there's like a huge but afterwards. The gracious manner in which they've handled this. So, Your Honor, I, I would say that. Mr. Fleming has suffered, um, and he has um, paid a very, very dear price in this in this proceeding and in um, the other federal proceeding that would discourage him from ever, ever engaging in similar conduct. And, and I believe, strongly believe, that Mr. Fleming will serve one day um, as a very important person who can. Oh, the martyr speech. Okay. Is is a um, a tremendous consequence of his misconduct. Why are you naming like random ass Thai dishes? Also, Your Honor, I can't, I can't not at lot these. Not what are you doing, Sal? That 
the notoriety that has surrounded this case and the publicity that has surrounded it um, has itself, honest, I mean, will serve as a significant general deterrence, but it is not something that every defendant has to deal with. Um, you know, it is, it has been quite, um, as Your Honor well knows, um, Hi. quite Hello. Um, significant. Um, Your Honor, I have some people um, that would like to address the court if the court is, is uh, would like, would listen to them. Um, and I would like to call them up now if that is acceptable to Your Honor. Lunch break. And Mr. Fleming also has some remarks that he would like to make to the court. All right, we're going to break for lunch now for one hour and 15. All right, they are actually back from the lunch break. So let's get up, stretch, use the bathroom, and then we'll be back in two minutes, okay? That's your lunch break, two minutes. That's all you get. I wanted to cover another case that Judge Newman oversaw. Um, it was the one about, what's her name, Rita Pangalangan. She left her 12-year-old daughter in a hot car. I think windows up. Allegedly, car wasn't running. And the daughter had cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy? Cerebral palsy. I can't say that word. And so, of course, she wasn't able to get out of the car herself. Um, I think she was like sort of like paralyzed. But um, Judge Newman oversaw that case. It was super sad. But the sentencing part was really, um, I think he does a really good job with um, his speech when he sentences these people. Fucking dickheads. Yeah, it was, it was super sad, dude. They had the entire, um, the entire five to six hours that she was sitting in the hot car. They had, um, the boyfriend's house had like a camera outside. So you just saw her sitting there five hours. The mom and the boyfriend were arguing. They disappear off camera to go have sex for like an hour. They come back. They argue some more. And she blames it on drugs. She said it's not murder. And Judge Newman was like, well, thank goodness you don't read the rules. So fuck her. Eight minutes. Puts us back. Oh, Why would that be important? Okay, I don't know who's speaking right now. Sorry. Thank you, Your Honor. As I was saying, the first speaker um, that I'd like to call to the uh, microphone is Mike Kinsaki. Um, member of the, the Buford community. Member of the Buford what? And also a member of the Florida Good afternoon, Judge. My name is Mike McCloskey. I'm privileged to practice law in this community for 57 years. I'm also privileged to call myself a trial lawyer. Okay. Uh, I've known Car uh, Corey Fleming uh, since he first started practicing law. However, I've known his family literally since the first day I moved to Buford, and that was March the 3rd of 1967. I was at the hearing when Judge Gergel sentenced Corey Fleming. Um, it was a remarkable proceeding. And the thing that made it remarkable was Corey Fleming. I remember Ms. Pinckney telling Corey that she still loved him and that she forgave him. And I never will forget his response. I can't, I, I don't know how many criminal cases I've handled. 
I don't know how many times are people who had either gone to trial and were awaiting sentence. I, I, I just don't know. But I've never heard anyone, after being forgiven, respond by thanking her and then following closely thereafter. And I understand you have a transcript of that proceeding, and I invite you to see if I'm correct in my recitation. Immediately thereafter, Corey Fleming said words I've never heard right, this from anyone good. in his position. I don't deserve to be forgiven. I do not. I, I've heard that before, but I okay. deserve to be forgiven. I've never seen a man empty himself to that extent. He was thoroughly disgusted. He admitted his behavior was a betrayal of trust that was placed in him. He admitted that he had disgraced his family. Okay. He admitted that he had dishonored his friends, his profession, his family. That's the Corey I saw a little over a month, no, a little less than a month ago. That proceeding was on the 15th of last month, a little less than last month. Well, why, why, why would that be important? Because the public was watching, the people were listening in, the judge was there. I mean, it's what you do behind private doors, you know? It's like how, oh my goodness, okay. I've heard a lot of negative stuff about Corey Fleming. Taco and Bell? there's no one here, his family, his friends, anybody that's here to support Corey, that supports his conduct that brought him in front of you today. They didn't support it in front of Judge Gergel on the 15th of August. However, they realize that there is great wisdom and a little piece of scripture found in the 51st Psalm, which is David's great lament after Nathan brought to his attention his great sin. I understand what you said. A broken and contrite heart, O Lord, you will not despise. We cannot embrace Corey's conduct, but I'll tell you what all of us do embrace. We embrace Corey in his broken and contrite state. And to what purpose would we do that? Why would we do something like that? Because we see a goodness in Corey that has been covered up but is coming to fruition now. There's been a lot of discussion about sentencing and the bad acts, rightly so, that Corey has committed. But I'm reminded that human nature and human behavior can change. Well, what is the most powerful vehicle to human, change human behavior and nature? It's adversity, it's struggle. We don't have our kids grow up healthy by giving them cream and ice cream all the time, cake and ice cream all the time we subject them to adversity. Now, this adversity is brought on by Corey himself. I wonder how many of us can claim that our conduct has been so pure, so innocent, that we haven't had the chance to grow up through adversity. No, we can't excuse, justify, or defend the events that brings Corey in front of you today. But we're not going to leave him. We're going to actively participate in his restoration in this community, his recovery, his healing. And through that, I hope that the court will find some assurance that through this period of adversity in Corey's life, he will grow, change forever for the better. I thank you for the opportunity of appearing before you in behalf of my friend, Corey Fleming. Sure, that wasn't a bad speech, though. Your Honor, next, um, Shannon Wilkes would like to address you. Good afternoon, Judge. Um, I met Corey and Eve in 1998 when I moved to Beaufort. Um, I needed a job, and I was a young paralegal at the time, and I began to work for Corey as his paralegal. And I did so for two and a half years. Corey was a relatively new attorney, and like I said, I was a new paralegal. But through working together, and Corey still reminds me of this today, we learned a lot from each other. Um, we had a positive and open working relationship where he treated me like a colleague and not just his paralegal or someone who worked for him. I worked with him. <clears throat> Corey always treated me and his clients with respect, compassion, and kindness. I, I have witnessed many times firsthand the love and devotion that Corey has for his wife, Eve, his children, his parents, his extended family, and his friends. One evening during a dark and desperate time in my life, and Corey probably doesn't even remember that he did this for me, I knocked on the front door of Corey and Eve's home. When Corey opened that door, he saw me not just as his paralegal, but a friend in need. Neither one hesitated to let me in that door and give me a shoulder to cry on. I'm here today as a supporter of Corey. Being a supporter of Corey does not mean that I don't understand that he made bad choices, because I do understand. And being a supporter of Corey does not make me a victim of anything. I am proud to stand here today, and I'm proud to see that Corey has taken responsibility of his bad choices. And these are choices that he cannot change. But he can choose how to face the effects.
Not true. Go to sleep. ...of the choices <laughs> he's made now and in the future. And I believe Corey is already doing that by taking responsibility and truly being remorseful because he is remorseful. He and I have talked on numerous occasions and have discussed our mutual Christian faith. We've shared scripture. We've mm. shared prayer. Okay. And lessons learned from this scripture. And I know through this faith, Corey will live a full life, a life full of purpose. And he has a willingness to help others find their own purpose. Thank you, Judge, for letting me speak. And I ask that you take the words that I've said into consideration in Corey's sentencing today. Your Honor, next we have um, Rich Giavella. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Rich Giavella. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to give me this chance to speak on behalf of my friend Corey Fleming. Um, I met Corey 22 years ago uh, when we both became new parents. Um, A couple years later, we both welcomed our second child, our children. Um, Over the years... Can we get Alex Murdoch in here? Maybe he'll come in here and talk about how great Corey is. <laughs> My family and I became very close friends with Corey, his parents, his wife, his children. Um, we spent many uh, holidays, birthdays, um, and weekends together. He Inappropriate chopper. He's the last person that I ever thought I'd be standing here talking to you about today. Um, I've only known Corey to be a loving son, husband, father, and friend. Um, it, I believe Corey to be a good man who made a bad choice. I also believe hey, that when he returns to his family and friends, he will dedicate his life to earn the respect, trust, and admiration of all who come to know him. Your Honor, I ask that you show Corey as much leniency and mercy as the court will allow. Thank you. Your Honor, there are several people that were here earlier. Um, who had to go. They didn't know it was going to last this long and had commitments and a, doctor, a very critical doctor appointment. And um, they left me their statements, and, and I'd like to read them if I can. Are they the same ones that you emailed to me or had me to read before? There are, Your Honor. There's, there's one statement from a person who's also written a letter, Kevin Green, and he says um, <coughs> much of the same things. Um, so if Your Honor wants to simply rely on the letter. Well, you've submitted them all to me to read, and I've read them, and uh, so I don't need you to. Read them again if you've already done that. Another from the same person? It's the same person. Okay. <laughs> and, um, but I, just want to I actually remember this too. Um, was it Judge Newman? Or Judge Newman was like, well, you already gave it to me, so you don't need to read it. It's fine. I, I, I got it. I know that there were a few other people. Um, in addition, um, Your Honor, I have Miss Denise Davis. It's the fact, it's not the fact that he was a good man. I get it. I understand that. It's just a point. I'm sure he's remorseful, but I'm sorry. I just don't get it. Maybe it's me. No, it's not you, Catherine. Because, like, like I said, if it was, like, a lapse in judgment or he was really desperate because of, like I said, maybe it was, like, you know, needing to support financially his, like, dying wife who's dying of cancer or something like that. I don't know. Like, depends on what the circumstances are. But the defense lawyer didn't mention any of that. So it just seems like to me he was just stealing money from his clients because they trusted him. He thought he can dupe them, and he was probably just padding his luxurious or very comfortable lifestyle with their money. I don't know. Um, like, yeah, it's it's great that he pleaded guilty. It's great that he was one of the first ones, but maybe because he realized that things were going to get fucked, and there were tr- paper trails. There's no way he was going to hide all this. Sounds like a uh, Judge Penny. <laughs> Your Honor, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on behalf of my friend, Corey Fleming. Hello. I've had the privilege of knowing Corey since 2009, and I'm eager to share my insights about his character and the positive impact he has had with my family and our community. I first met Corey at the YMCA, where our shared passion for competitive running and physical fitness brought us together. Over the years, we participated in numerous local running events forging a strong bond based on our shared interests and values. I've had the opportunity to witness firsthand Corey's dedication to the YMCA. For the past eight years, I've overseen the YMCA's River Swim, a signature fundraiser for our Learn to Swim program. Corey, alongside his daughter, participated in the challenging 3.2 mile swim. I said it first. And when I approached him for sponsorship and support of the wise cause, worthy cause, he didn't hesitate. Because maybe the money was stolen from the victims? Oh, I don't know. 
in it. Maybe because it wasn't his money? Oh, I don't know. In addition to our YMCA swim, I could always count on Corey to sponsor and actively participate in a running event I chaired for the Parents Association of my son's school. Uh, the victims went earlier. We had Tony Satterfield and then Gloria Satterfield's sister and then Eric Bland spoke on um, behalf of some of the victims. Because I think Eric Bland also represents other people that were um, defrauded as well. Not just the Satterfield, I think. He generously extended beyond financial contributions. He consistently went out of his way to help others. I can personally attest to this. I'm a single mother to three sons. There have been times, <clears throat> excuse me, when I relied on Corey's expertise to fix various household issues. He never hesitated to lend a hand. One vivid example is when my outdoor shower pipe froze and started spraying water everywhere on Christmas morning. Despite the holiday festivities, Corey was there to help at a moment's notice and without hesitation. Moreover, Corey's unwavering commitment to his family is truly commendable. I've had the privilege of not only being friends with Corey, but also developing a close bond with his family. During my own challenging times, Corey and his family extended their kindness to me without hesitation. Their support and empathy served as a beacon of light through my moments of difficulty. Corey has been a guiding figure in the lives of my sons. He's been a mentor, providing them with support, advice, and empathetic ear when they needed someone to confide in. His genuine care and interest in their well-being have made him a beloved figure in our home, and we often refer to him as Uncle Corey, despite not being related by blood. <coughs> Corey's character is one of generosity, acts of kindness, and a strong sense of responsibility towards his family, friends, and community. He has consistently demonstrated his commitment to making a positive impact, and his contributions have left a lasting mark on the lives of many, especially my family. I re respectfully request that you consider my testimony when determining Corey's sentence. I firmly believe that his actions and genuine goodwill he has shown throughout the years are a testament to his character. I kindly ask you for your leniency, mercy, and grace in this matter. I believe Corey's positive qualities should be weighed. Yeah, because I'm trying to think. Um... I'm trying to think if, okay, let's say, for example, my brother murdered someone. Would I, would I be there to speak for him? I feel like if it was like a, depends on, I guess, depends on the type of murder, but if it was like cold hearted murder. Like, I don't know if I'd be able to, I don't think so. And then let's say if I had a close friend that I found out that was, that was stealing money from other people. These aren't just like people with money. These are people who are. You know, like, for example, uh, the Satterfield family, um, the boys lost their mother tragically in a fall, and they were essentially just being strung along for, <laughs> for I don't know, a year or two before they even heard anything about the money. And then also Miss Pinkney Creighton mentioned that she was in a horrible accident, I think. Oh, no, sorry. It was Eric Bland that mentioned she was like an accident. A lot of her bones were shattered. She was also mourning the death of her husband. Like, I don't know, man. If I had, like, a really close friend and I found out they, like, stole money from all these people and it was over the span of 10 years, I don't know. I don't think I would be... I don't know. I'm trying to think of, like, who's a really good friend that I have that I would speak out for. I, I feel like the only person I would speak out for, maybe, would be for... Would be for Dennis, I guess? But that's because I know him. Unless I found out that he was doing some shady shit behind the... I don't know. I'm just trying, I'm just trying to put myself in their shoes. You know, because what I don't like, I don't like people blindly just supporting others just because, oh, they're my friend. They're my family. But like if they fucked up and they did some shit, I don't know if they would really deserve your support. But I don't know. I'm just trying to. I'm glad I don't have that kind of dilemma. Yeah, I don't know. I just. I don't know. I guess we'll see when it happens. I'll let you guys know what I decide to do. During the sentencing process. Thank you, Judge Newman, for allowing me to speak on behalf of my friends. Next, Your Honor, is Lisa O'Brien. Good afternoon, Judge. I am Lisa O'Brien, and... I also said that I would narc as well. <laughs> I would be a fucking narc, okay? If I found out that you did some fuck shit, I'm a tell on you. Um, I'm a Beaufort oh. resident, born and raised here. Um, I met Corey and his wife and children at the Y... Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't know. Um, YouTube started getting more, um, I don't know if the word is aggressive with their ads. So they're either telling me to place the ads manually 
but I don't know if it's like Twitch because Twitch ads are kind of annoying. I just have it set automatically, so I don't have to keep doing it. Um, but yeah, I get money, but I think it's just like pennies <laughs> uh, for like the live streams. At least I don't know. Um, I taught spin there for about 16 years and he and his uh, family actively participated in my classes. Um, in 2011, our oldest son was brutally attacked and beaten and robbed in his home in the middle of the night here in Port Royal. Um, I didn't ask for help, um, but Corey knew my anguish. He saw it on my face and he approached me outside uh, after class and told me that he and his wife would do anything to help us through this process. Even though the prosecutor would take control, he would be there for us. Um, he spent countless hours talking to us over the phone and in person and just helping us to understand what we were going to face. I've stood in one of these courtrooms at least five times as the mother of a victim. Each time, Corey has put himself out to be there for our family without any anything asked or without any wait aren't youtube ads skippable though it's the ones where it's like you watch for like the first like three seconds and then you can just skip it that's what i like about youtube you can just skip the ads twitch on the other hand will subject you to like <laughs> three minutes of ads <laughs> but also why are you watching youtube without having youtube premium get youtube premium it's it's so good you don't have to get any ads on youtube whatsoever no ads Bragging or patting himself on the back for being a good person. And one I think you can share with like five other people in your household. It's like Netflix or something. So, yeah, just get some friends in your household, your family members or whatever, and then um, get YouTube premium and then just split it five different ways. Yeah, it's the way to go. I don't know how you guys are watching this without YouTube premium. Unless you're like, a, I don't know, maybe a teenager, you ain't got no money or something. <laughs> they increased it recently. Uh, like I say, get other people to split it with you. What is it like? Uh, like fourteen ninety nine or some shit? My conversations with Corey at the Y, he told me that one of the hardest things he had to do was to stand in the courtroom while people that didn't have an attorney didn't know what to say when he could easily go up there and help them. And every day it was hard for him. And there's one more thing I want to mention. When all of this happened, uh, we, moved, we moved upstate a couple of years ago. And when all of this happened, I came down and I wanted to go into one of the classes and see my old friends. And I asked Corey if he was going to be there, and he showed up, and I told him, I said, you know, I'm not going to ask you anything about these things. I don't want you to... See, oh, a student, $7.99 a month. Individual, $13.99. Family, $22.99. Add up to five members. Oh, it is $22.99 for family. Yeah, so $22.99 and divide by five. You get other people to join in on you. <laughs> feel pressured to ever be around us and he stopped me in my tracks and he said no i have learned from this already things about myself i didn't even realize i needed to know the remorse was clear and his actions to stop me and tell me that he had guilt are something i can't even explain Pretty sure you're going to be a teenager and not have money. Well, that was just an example. I mean, if you're not a teenager and you're in your 20s, 30s, whatever, and you don't want to pay for it, then don't pay for it. Just get the ads. I didn't ask him. And he just Better told than Twitch. Me, Twitch, you got to sit there and watch the entire thing. I think what I want to say most is I'm here on my own accord. I drove three and a yeah, half hours to husband. come. I don't feel obligated. I don't feel like I have to be here. And certainly, I'm not forced to be here. I would stand up for Corey in a minute and Eve and his family because one thing in somebody's life that happens a couple of times does not define them. He is more, the whole picture of who he is, is more than this. And this is terrible, but this does not define him. And I just ask for you to consider that. Was the assailant apprehended who, uh, the there were five assailants, five assailants, and they were apprehended the night of the crime. Mm -hmm. They were caught by Detective Rue, um, and it took about two years to prosecute. They did all plead guilty. How much we, time? What was their sentence? Um, it ranged from 15 years to 20 years for Good. all five. Good. 15 years to 20 years each. Yes, sir. Well, each person was sentenced with a um, concurrent 
So they were charged with three things, burglary in the first degree, armed robbery, and possession of a weapon during a violent crime. The burglary first degree... Um, I will say, though, I did get a notification for Hulu saying they were going to up my membership. I think Hulu is like, like $17.99. Isn't that, is that expensive? That sounds really expensive, right? Or maybe because like I have my streaming services split with other people now, so I don't really know what we're really paying, but we pay for the Hulu one. It's like $17.99. Sorry, back to this. It was 20 years for one individual and the armed robbery 20 and five for the weapon. And that process matched each person down the line. How old were they? They ranged in ages from 23 was the oldest person. The youngest one was about a month from turning 17. Oof, yeah. what, what year was your that? Life? 2011. Are they still in prison? Yes, sir. The first one will be released next year. Oof. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I like Good Netflix. Afternoon, Laura Blue. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Laura Blue. Um, from 13 years um, being in the Buford area, um, a citizen of Buford, South Carolina, I've known Corey as being my landlord. Um, Okay. It's just so much I could say about this man. I have two children. We were homeless living in a hotel. Go on cell phone. Um, it was during Christmas time. We were transitioning from the hotel to the the residence in which he was allowing me to rent. And when I went into the home, uh, so much I can say about this man. He immediately shared with me that I didn't have to do the first month rent and make sure I get my kids some toys for Christmas. My son was seven, my daughter was nine. We've been in the home 13 years. My son graduated from Buford High School. He's now in the United States Navy. I have a 22-year-old daughter. She is currently the business manager at St. Helena in Port Royal. I have a four-year-old grandchild that actually came into the home while we were there. I would say from landlord to family, that's how we look at him. Both of my children looks at him very highly as an uncle. He's very respected by both of them. In spite of what's going on, we talked. I've relocated to Missouri, so I flew in to speak on who he is to us as a family. My daughter spoke at the federal, and I will say this, Judge. During this time, while I was in Missouri, Corey and I text, talk, try to encourage him, plenty nights through texting and sending scriptures to let him know that in the Bible, God forgive us of all our sins. He asked me when I came down and visit my family here, if it was possible to just... You know, this actually looks pretty good for him, though. He does have a lot of people that are here speaking about him. Um, for the Hulu thing, no, it's like seven ninety nine dollars with... Um, if, you want, if, you want, if you're willing to watch with ads, it's seven ninety nine. dollars But the ads, they're horrible on Hulu. I hate it. You're so conflicted come by his home, he needed to share something with me. In spite of the media, in spite of people around me, he called me, him and his wife, went to the home, he talked with me, he shared things, he didn't go in depth or anything, he just let me know. He did something, he was very sorry about it, he just couldn't get over the hump of understanding that it has to be, it has to go, he has to forgive himself. I will tell you today, Judge, on behalf of my family, we truly, truly, by no means, Look at him more than just my landlord. Again, he's my family. I rest assured his family has supported me tremendously. They didn't ask me to come. They didn't beg me. To, I asked them, can I please come? Can I please every day? What can we do? Because again, like I say, this man took my family in, put a roof over my head with two children, and he made sure not one day if I was late, he overcharged me. Not one day he made eviction notice or anything. And I've, I've been late many of times. Yet he let us stay in the home. He was ready to renovate the home right before my son was graduating. And I was working for Department of Social Service inside Child Protective Service as an investigator, not making much money. And I told him, I said, job. Mr. Fleming, if we leave, where could we possibly go for the next three months until my son graduated? He said, you know what, you guys stay here 
And when he graduates, then we'll go ahead and start the renovation of the home. So I just ask that you just take into consideration what I said about this man. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, um, I'm not going to read the statement because I do have letters from Kevin Green, um, Jay Taylor. The Court of Clerk. We find out tomorrow, potentially. At this time, I'd like my client to address the court. Okay. Um, and I would just stand for the criticism. All right, come on up, Corey. Your Honor, excuse me. Thank you for the opportunity to address this court. For many years, I stood in this very courtroom representing people. Many of those people had broken the law. I was very aware that one bad decision or a series of bad decisions can have life changing and irreversible consequences. Can you guys hear? Despite knowing this firsthand, I made some terrible decisions and I broke the law. Today, I offer this court no excuses. There are no excuses. I place the blame for my actions on my shoulders, nobody else's. I never imagined standing here and being in this circumstance. I have a profound and deep disappointment in myself. It is a very difficult and constant feeling that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. Today, I'm grateful for the ability to thank the Satterfields and the Pinckneys for expressing their forgiveness to me when I was sentenced to federal court and for letting me know that they're praying for me. It means the world to me and it's helping me through a very difficult time. Although I've already made these remarks in federal court, I want this court to know my regrets, my failings, and my heart. And I don't think I can say how sorry I am too much to any of these people. So I'll say these words again to the Satterfield family. Your mother was a very good woman. In the aftermath of losing her so tragically, suddenly, you deserved a lawyer that had only your best interest at heart. Yeah. You deserve someone to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. You deserve someone who talked with you. You deserve someone who dealt with you fairly. And you deserve someone who would not betray your trust. I did not do those things. I failed you. To Michelle Pinckney, I not only betrayed you as a client, I betrayed you as a friend. You suffered a tremendous loss that no parent should ever endure. You, were, you and your entire family were good to me. I have, I have no words for how empty I feel when I think of how you must feel about me. You deserved much better. I failed you and I failed your family. I think Newman said he was facing. To both the Satterfields and the Pinkneys. Our credit says he was failures, facing 185 years. I am years. Honestly sorry. I know that an apology is inadequate, but please know that I am genuinely incredibly sorry for my treatment of you. Next, I want to apologize to my former colleagues in the South Carolina Bar, the South Carolina Supreme Court, and the Office of Disciplinary Counsel. My actions have cast a negative perception on the legal profession. I understand that the public's confidence in our judicial system has eroded as a result of this case. I am deeply sorry that my actions have negatively impacted the profession that I loved and people that I care deeply for. I have permanently resigned from the South Carolina Bar because I no longer deserve the privilege of practicing amongst you. I want to apologize to my former law partners and staff. I know that my actions have caused a tremendous amount of stress, burden, and heartache on each one of you. I'm truly sorry for the pain I've caused. I'm sorry to my friends and members of the Beaufort community that I have let down. I love Beaufort. I've always considered myself lucky to live amongst this community. And I'm extremely grateful for those who have stood up for me and offered kind words that were very much needed. My wife, my children, my parents. I will spend the rest of my life regretting the shame, the turmoil that I've inflicted on our family. Each of you have been a tremendous source of support to me during the past two years. I don't feel that I deserve it, but I promise, I promise you that I will strive every day to earn back your respect and be worthy of your love. Thank you for standing by me during this very dark time. I love you so much. Your Honor, I know that I deserve to be punished for my conduct. I take full responsibility for my actions. I can assure this court that I will live the rest of my days trying to follow the lessons I learned 
to remember what is actually important in life, time spent with my family and my friends. To know that doing things for others is how to gain fulfillment out of life. It does not come through material possessions. A lot of people have spoken to me, my friends and community, about what I've lost in this ordeal, but I'm looking at all that I've gained. I've had to take a very hard look in the mirror. I didn't like everything that I saw. I've grown from this both spiritually and emotionally. I've taken stock in my life and realized how lucky I am. I'm incredibly grateful for my wife, my children, my family, my friends, for their support and love. I believe there were times in my life when I took these people for granted, but I'm looking at life through a new lens. When I decided to plead guilty in federal court, I didn't have any assurances of what my sentence would be there or, or here. But I made a conscious decision to have trust in the legal system, one that I betrayed. I betrayed the system, and I am perhaps undeserving of that. I understand how difficult your role in this process is, and I sincerely thank you for the opportunity to address your court and for considering the information presented on my behalf. Your Honor, in conclusion, I just meant to make a very, very brief remarks. I, I okay, decent speech. The time that you spent with us today, I mean, you know, allowing us to speak and allowing people that want to come and talk on the court's behalf to, to be heard. Um, as I said, I know Your Honor um, has a very difficult job in this process, and I have always observed firsthand the dignity that you treat <coughs> defendants with. I, I would respectfully submit to you, Your Honor, that it, in this case, a concurrent 46 month sentence is sufficient punishment and will protect the public, um, it will serve as a deterrent. Yeah, I did 1.5. He speaks slow. There's already been a significant turn effect, but I think uh, the sentence here will serve that purpose as well. Mr. Fleming has accepted responsibility for his bad decisions and his illegal conduct. In the process of calculating his federal sentence, there's, a, there's an enhancement called abuse of position of trust. And this was calculated in to Mr. Fleming's sentencing guidelines, and he was sentenced, he was held accountable for the abuse of position. Have we ever had anyone in the history that you guys know of that asked for the maximum sentence because they said that they deserve to be punished for the crimes that they committed? Or is that just like a movie thing? I feel like I've... Has there been anyone like that? Do you guys know? Position of trust. That's what he did. He abused his position of trust. I'm just curious. And abused his Sorry. law license. And he's taken full accountability for that. You have heard about his worst days. And I hope you will also know that it's those bad thing. decisions do not define his life. One of the things the court always uh, considers in these matters is whether or not somebody has a criminal history. Mr. Fleming had no criminal history prior to this case. Um, he has made, I would submit, significant efforts already at rehabilitation, um, and he's going to continue to do that as he um, serves his sentences. He has expressed extreme remorse. Um, he only seeks a chance, Your Honor, to serve his time and then rebuild his life. And, while he, and, and to, to be able to be released from prison and still have time to contribute to society. Uh, Your Honor, in conclusion, I would submit that a 46-month concurrent sentence um, will encompass all of the conduct, all of the illegal conduct to which he has acknowledged, um, including the Pinckney case, which was, I discussed was already considered. The Pinckneys were victims in the federal case. Their loss amount was calculated, their restitution was ordered, and they were treated under the Mandatory Victims Act. But a 46-month concurrent sentence will reflect the seriousness of this offense. It will promote respect for the law and it will provide just punishment. And I thank you again, Your Honor, for all of your consideration and for you uh, taking the time to hear us today. Sorry, she's asking for 46 months? I was reading the chat. Thank you, Your Honor. Now. I know this has been a long proceeding, and I'm not going to talk for a long time. Abuse of a position of trust. Your Honor was asking one of the people that spoke on behalf of Mr. Fleming about those terrible crimes that happened to that person and the ages of those people. And we don't know now what their lives were like, their backgrounds were like, the opportunities they had, the privileges they had. And there was very significant accountability for that, for those young men, and rightfully so. Five and 10? I don't think so, that's too low. But there has to be significant accountability here too. One thing you didn't hear a lot about, Your Honor, was the facts of what Mr. Fleming, even to this point, actually claimed. What we know is that when he first got called by Lee Cope, he said, oh, the Satterfields, but he didn't disclose, oh, I was colluding with Alec, oh, I'd stolen checks, oh, I'd been stealing from Ms. Pinkney prior to that. Mm -hmm. He didn't disclose any of that. In fact, for the longest time, he claimed he was a victim. And then when the state grand jury called him red-handed, he then changed. Oof. He started to say, out of the generosity of who I am, I cut my fee in half. And so if I did steal, they still were better off than they would have been if I'd taken my full fee. Creighton is here to slay. Red from Mark. Memo. And she left out 
one clause about what the state's position is. And that clause is that what Fleming didn't realize, because he knew that the scheme as usual depended on some significant portion of the funds going to the family so that that sleight of hand works. They're too focused on this right here to know that this is going on behind them. And what Mr. Fleming, when finally pushed against the wall, his final version that went to federal court with, essentially this, Your Honor, that every single one of those forged checks that he cut from his trust account, the 403000 one, the $2.9 million one, and the $118,000 one, that he believed that Alec, that those boys, that the Satterfield family was going to get every dime of that. And the only thing he was willing to concede once he had finally been pushed against the wall time after time and revelation after revelation was that he had withheld that $105,000 in fake prosecution expenses for Alec. And the interesting thing about that is, is that for you to accept that to be true, what his version is, is that Alec never even came and got that. Because as we know, there was $113,000 still in his trust account when everything came to light. So what he is trying to admit is, is that yes, I colluded with Alec Murdoch, but I didn't think that he had gotten one thin dime of that money. And when the state, and she made some, some discussions about one agency deferring to another, and she mentioned press releases, and of course, as always, when the state grand jury first indicted Mr. Murdoch and others, that's going back in November of 2021. You know, in a press release, we're going, to thank, we're going to thank supporting agencies. But she's had those transcripts. She's read the extensive testimony that we presented from the witnesses in the state grand jury in November of 21, and December of 21, and January of 22, and February of 22, and March of 22, April of 22, and on and on. She's read the information about her client that was gathered by state grand jury subpoenas during that time. And when Mr. Fleming sat down and told that story, that I believed that every dime was going to those Satterfield family. Oh, no. That, when I was at my dirtiest, my motives were the most pure. That because I had cut my fee in half, even if I had stolen money, they were still going to be better off than they would have been. And the state said, that makes no sense. And it makes no sense for all that I've detailed for you here today. That course of conduct that shows that he knew what was going on. He was instrumental in it. Damn, I was starting to feel a little bit sorry for him. And then credit just reins me back in. And so when he talks about accepting responsibility, he's not accepting true responsibility. And that is why do a poll. there needs to be accountability in state court. That is why that when the state said, hold on, Mr. Fleming, that doesn't fit with the facts. That doesn't fit with common sense. That doesn't fit with all we know about how this went down. Mr. Fleming, and we said, give us some more information, give us some more time. Mr. Fleming instead went down the street and made a deal to just bypass accountability in this courtroom, which this is where the affront occurred. Mr. F Mr. Barbier went in great detail, and Mr. Fleming said it too, about how he played guilty in federal court with no deals. No deals. And he talks about how the opinions were considered in the pre-sentencing report, which of course the state doesn't have. We don't know what was in that. But what he leaves out, when they make this great presentation to you, how they play with no deals, and therefore that's enough. Just let the feds handle it. We just thumbed our nose at the state, thumbed our nose at our obligations in the agreement we signed, and went down the street. What he leaves out is, is that he was allowed to plead to a single lesser offense, one charge, and zero to five years. If you had done one charge of what it should have been, that's a 20-year offense. And even Judge Gergel in the plea transcript on page 75, when they were trying to say, well, there's no deals, we didn't do a, a substantial or a downward departure, says, well, in some ways, you've already given him a 5K, which is a downward departure motion, by allowing him to plead to the less serious offense. One charge for zero to five years is not enough, Your Honor. It's not enough for the reasons that I expressed to you. It's not enough because of the difference between what was admitted to in federal court and what we have exposed here today. It's not enough because of the difference that today is where there's the first real accountability, a real conviction for Pamela Pinkney. And it's not enough because the state judicial system needs its say for those who abuse it. I said before, a lawyer should not have a decade of conduct and get one stop shot. For that reason, we submit there should be a lead sentence for the Satterfields and a consecutive lead sentence for the Pinkneys. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, man. Thank you. Well, I guess we've been here listening to um, argument and presentations concerning this, oh, goodness, about four hours or more. Uh, and prior to that time, I was submitted voluminous materials to review. The one thing that I did not review is Judge Gurgle's transcript. Uh, as much as I admire him and his uh, capabilities as a federal judge and the great work that he does, I don't defer to the federal court system for uh, in making my decisions. Um, I practiced law for 24 years and have been a judge for 23 years. During my time as a prosecutor, I've prosecuted police chiefs, 
probation officers, professors. Damn, do we have any footage of him being a prosecutor? I, I would love to watch it. And as, judge, as a judge, I've sentenced church secretaries, preachers, professors, law enforcement folks. Yeah, same. I think I always err on the side of a more lenient sentence. I don't know. Maybe is it because I'm a softie or something? I don't know. I feel like he has the potential to change. You know, he has the potential to do good for his community in the future. Him running in prison for a long time wouldn't do any good. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know, man. Maybe you should get a huge slap on the wrist because you shouldn't have done this to begin with. I don't know. I go back and forth. I'm very, like, indecisive. Oh, my God. I would be a horrible judge. <laughs> but I don't know. It's tough, you know? It's like, maybe he should get a pretty lengthy sentence because he shouldn't have done this in the first place. But maybe at the same time, you know, maybe he did learn his lesson and maybe he can change. And nah, 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 nah. so, yeah. But until I Tough. came down to this 14th Circuit in March, I never um, sentenced a lawyer. Oof. And that lawyer was sentenced to consecutive uh, life sentences. And now I have a lawyer, co defendant, colleague of his, facing 195 years in prison. In addition to, to dealing with and sentencing all those folks, uh, I've certainly okay, dealt Dragon. with my share of grand larceny cases. That's true. He's too old to not have known anybody. Yeah, oh, I don't know. Oh, I'm so, yeah, I don't know. Oh. People who might steal an automobile, facing 10 years in prison. A shoplifter who, uh, after the third offense, is facing 10 years in prison. And I've had my share of sentencing people like the, um, the assailants who... Um, were convicted of the crimes that um, was mentioned. Ten years is a long time. And dished out a lot of time to many of them. So this is my second time in these 47 years having to deal with an issue of sentencing a, a lawyer. And I cannot imagine a more devastating, a more anything more uh, precedent. This is unprecedented. This is unimaginable. This is, uh, I think, the greatest crime for a lawyer in the history of the state of South Carolina. Certainly in the number of years being faced and uh, the impact of the uh, crimes on the citizens of the state. I cannot imagine anyone going to a lawyer in South Carolina at this moment in time and having complete trust in what that lawyer uh, says to them. Of course, part of my years of practice, I've had clients come to me with, uh, you know, the, the, and they come and said that they didn't know how much money they got on their case, that they went to the lawyer's office and the, uh, the check was turned over and they just asked to sign the check. So they came to me to find out how much money they got in their case. I think um, Murdoch's like 55, and I think they went to college together. So I think he's probably like in the 55 realm. Um, but this, this is totally un unprecedented. I cannot, there's no way. There was a case in this state where the amount of thievery exceeded what's occurred in this case. Now, the, um, the presentations on behalf of Mr. Fleming were certainly inspiring. Um, you know, reminded me of the revival that we had at our church last week. It reminded me of uh, funeral services that I've had to attend. Uh, particularly within the last year. Um, and I've heard a lot of testimonies, so much so that uh, they can go on and on in churches, you know, at a funeral. And so we uh, ask people to limit their comments to two minutes because everyone has so many good things to say. Uh, and uh, most folks reminded me of what was said in federal court, uh, sort of a, a disregard to the dual sovereignty of the state court. You know, I, I didn't re read uh, Judge Gurgle's transcript. He's in a different system, a different sovereignty. Uh, I've never uh, deferred to a federal court to guide my sentence as a state court judge. Now, for all of the great things um, that were said uh, about Mr. Fleming, um, and I made the funeral reference because it's as if uh, we're as if he's no longer with us, as if, you know, we're at a funeral. Um, 
uh, and that he will not have an opportunity to redeem himself. He will not have an opportunity to do good deeds. And someone mentioned that uh, the things that he was able to share his tale with others. Um, well, he'll have an opportunity to share his tale and his story and the consequences of his choices with people that he will meet that will be in dire need of his counsel and advice. Now, since coming here from Murdoch and doing that trial in March, and I was back here two weeks ago uh, for a trial, another trial in Colleton County, a mother who had been teacher of the year in the school system there. Oh, I think he's going to talk about Rita Pang, whatever her name is. Oh, my God, we we're just talking about that case. It's so sad. Left her 13-year-old totally handicapped and disabled child in a car beginning at 11 a.m. when it was 90 one degrees outside and left that child in the car until about 5 or 6 p.m. And she's constantly in and around the car with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And a climatologist testified that the temperature in that car got up to 139 degrees. And you're talking about remorse and the testimonies and presentations over this mother and her mistake. Um, she was on, on methamphetamine with her boyfriend. Um, as remorseful, I cannot imagine anyone making me, giving me a presentation of a mother uh, who loved her child and who went wayward and more concerned about using drugs and pleasing her boyfriend than caring for her, trial, her child. And she got 37 years in prison, convicted of murder. That was two weeks ago, here in the same 14th Circuit. Yeah, arguing was a murder. And the folks who came to talk with him and said, you know, she loved her child. She would nothing she wouldn't do for her child. She had her child in the Special Olympics, but she abandoned the child. And so, when I'm listening to Mr. Bamberg talk about um, uh, Mr. Pinckney, Hakeem Pinckney, I'm thinking of that same type of vulnerability um, that that child had. He was a child at the time, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, and, and and so he placed his trust. <laughs> And, and, and a respected member of the bar, a very respected member of this community. And I can tell that by the all of the folks here. Um, I think I heard about a research paper that was done on parents leaving their kids in the car because they're just so scrambled and they're so busy or they're just like stressed. Um, sometimes they think they actually dropped their kid off at daycare when they really didn't and they go into work. I've heard about that, but I haven't read about that yet. But uh, I mean, I don't know, man. I remember, um, was it my sister that told me? I don't know if it was part of this, but um, apparently my mom, when she would go gambling, she would leave my siblings in the car. But they were old enough to get out of the car if they needed to. But, like, my sister was telling me that she would sit in the car for, like, six fucking hours. Like, what am I doing here? <laughs> I don't know, man. Damn parents. The murder conviction alone was strange. It was involuntary manslaughter, but they converted to murder. I don't know what's going on there. Which one? The um, Rita Pangalangaling one? That one? Yeah, I Sometimes say that there isn't very much between any of us. We all have good and we all have bad. And certainly uh, everyone um, was here to tell me about all the good in Mr. Fleming. But we're dealing with the consequences of the bad. And that is as bad as it gets in this case for a lawyer Oof. who has a prior record. Uh, um, he has no prior uh, convictions. But when you carry on a scheme of over a decade, that's a record. Uh, record that did not result in charges or convictions, but a record of his life. And as bad as it was with um, Mr. Pinckney, then we moved to the Satterfields. Again, vulnerable people. I think in that case, um, it was just weird because she was around the car. Like, it wasn't like they forgot about the kid. They disappeared off the scene. Like, they were actually, like, right around the car as they were arguing. And I think even um, shortly after the boyfriend put the child in the back seat, he was like taking his shirt and like waving it around like this, like signaling that, yeah, it's fucking hot out here. And I don't know, the whole thing was just so, so, so wild. And then when they realized that the door was locked, I think like maybe, I don't know, it was like three to four hours in, there was like the sense of urgency was lacking. Um, if you realize that your dog or your kid was locked in the car and the car is like not running, right? You would probably call 911 for help. You would try to smash in through the door. But no, they like, you know, they try to get, they try to open the door. They couldn't. 
they like walked around the house trying to get some tools didn't work and then they drove off and disappeared for like 45 minutes um to try to get the keys from somewhere i don't know it was like the lack of like urgency was so weird so i know there were people in the chat that were theorizing that she did it on purpose maybe um i think she i don't know i think the two of them were just probably just dumb fucks or something i don't know it just made no sense um it was crazy it was wild but yeah it was it was it was wild um i think she got what she deserved man that child suffered um when they talked about her autopsy i think she had like sores and um what was it again oh, was it like sores or burns or something around her body because she was just being like heated they essentially said that her brain was like cooked just sitting in the car but yeah it was it was it was just really sad and when you look at the footage um there was like no shade it was just the car sitting in bright sunlight for like five six hours man oh she had boils was that what it was yeah it was just it was just so sad oof i don't know that was that was a weird one i i, I didn't i didn't understand what the fuck was up with the mom and the boyfriend? Yeah. So I imagine, and I know that uh, many of the friends and family and colleagues were totally shocked, not at what the good Corey Fleming um, has done over a period of time, but this Cor Corey Fleming in these cases. And quite frankly, when, when the people come to me and want to lay the burden on me, say, Judge, please be lenient, well, that's not my responsibility. Ooh. Yeah, I believe in justice and mercy. Oh, okay. Hold on a second. Um, what is happening? Um, this is Corey Fleming. He's a co-conspirator of Alex Murdoch in the um, financial crimes. So he's getting sentenced right now. Alex Murdoch is going to have his trial scheduled for the financial crimes um, in two months. And then Russell Lafitte, another co-conspirator. I don't know what happened. The audio was really bad. So, all right. Quite frankly, when, when the people come to me and wanted to lay the burden on me so judge please be lenient and that's not my responsibility oh. you know, i believe in justice and mercy oh. the leniency is not part of micah the scripture damn it's gonna be more than 25 years facing 195 years in prison Anything else before I impose my sentence? I mean, Corey Fleming, come for sentencing. Corey Fleming is a lawyer. So it's not like he's some, you know, dumb fuck guy who doesn't know what he was potentially facing when he broke these laws. Uh, yeah, he's a lawyer. Oh, my goodness. I think Judge Newman's going to go hard. My heart bleeds for you because I have no doubt of the quality of human being that you are, as reflected by all of the positive comments. Okay. Um, but you must suffer the consequences of um, your actions in these cases that you're standing before me for, and um, uh, tempering justice with mercy. Um, it's my responsibility to impose a sentence. And there are so many. If I were to spend time here now imposing a sentence on each of these indictments individually, you know, we'd be here for a few hours probably. So suffice it to say with regard to the Satterfields, and um, need my clerk here to take notes for me, um, on count 10, where the uh, exposure is zero to five. The sentence is five years. Um, I, I wrote insurance. Is that insurance fraud? Yes, sir. Uh, that's uh, count number or, in, or indictment number. Uh, count 11. Yes, on the exposure is zero to 10. The sentence is 10 years. Oof. On the breach of trust with a 10 year possibility or exposure, the sentence is 10 years. On the money laundering, where the Exposure is zero to 20 years. The sentence is 10 years. On the five-year breach of trust, mm -hmm. the sentence is five years. On the five-year uh, money laundering, I believe it is, is five years. And on the computer crime, the sentence is five years. And each of those will run concurrent with each other. Okay. As to the breach of trust involving the Pinkney, five and, counts five and nine, is it? 
uh, where the exposure is five years, the sentence is five years. Is it concurrent? The 30-day breach of trust, count six, the uh, sentence is time served. On the conspiracy charge, sentence is five years. On the breach of trust, where the exposure is 10 years. Now, we need to know if it's going to be concurrent or consecutive with the Pinkby and the Satterfield charges. The sentence is 10 years. And that sentence will run consecutive to the sentence that you're currently serving. <laughs> All the sentences otherwise will run concurrent with each other. I'm going to um, defer any um, restitution hearings. Uh, I believe it's just too convoluted for me to get a true handle on what the state is seeking and what should be ordered. And I, I tend to think that it's, um, um, well, I don't want to prejudge whether it's necessary or not, or not but I'm going Catherine. to defer anything, any ruling regarding any restitution. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether the state is actually seeking it, whether it's an actual loss, uh, if there is, whether the parties can agree. Uh, we can have a separate hearing solely dealing with restitution if necessary. As sentence of the court, best wishes, Mr. Fleming. Thank you, sir. I don't know what the exact number was, but it sounded like a lot of years. I think it's more than, way more than 25. <clears throat> Anything further here today, Mr. Waters? No, sir. That would be secondary matters for today, Your Honor. All right. Court will be adjourned. Seven years, I think, for the federal crimes. Um, yeah, I think for the federal crimes, seven years. I thought I saw that somewhere. Hey, Kay, how are you doing today? All right, what's going on here? Well, because when he first read those charges, um, he said those were concurrent. So those can all be served at the same time. However, the charges with um, the charges with Satterfield and the Pinkney, that's consecutive. So I think we take the largest number, right? In the first with the Satterfield, it was like 10. And then we take the largest number in Pinkney, and that's 10. And then those are served um, consecutively. That's, I think it's 20. Is that what it was? Uh, I'm getting different things in this chat. 15, 20 years, 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Total was over 50. I don't know. My understanding is 20 years, but we're going to get a bunch of million numbers in here. 85 years. Because <laughs> those, the first, those are, okay. I, I, he's saying, I don't know. I say, I'm saying 20 years. I'm going to stick with 20 years. He's not going to spend nothing but 10 to 15. Um, 20 years and then seven years for the federal one. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe he'll be let on good behavior. But um, wow, that was a good speech from Judge Newman. I feel like Judge Newman gives really good speeches. All right. So tomorrow, tomorrow, we're waiting to see if um, there's going to be any steps taken into the investigation of the court of clerk from the Murdoch murder trial. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Apparently, Harputlian says tomorrow's going to be when we hear the news today or tomorrow. I think they said tomorrow was a deadline. So 37 years of the mom who left her handicapped kid in the car. Yeah, this, I think what was really damning about that, um, I mean, for sure, they had security cam footage of her and the boyfriend um, arguing like in front of the car. They were arguing for a little bit, then they were kissing, making up. They disappear for like an hour to go have sex. And the boyfriend did confirm they did have sex. And then they came back. It looked like they were arguing again and they were talking. And then at some point they realized that the car was locked and she couldn't get in. Um, I think that was like three to four hours in. And then from that point on, there was just no sense of urgency to get the child out. Like when I say sense of urgency, I mean like doubt 911, panic, bang on the windows and try to smash the window in to get the kid out. Um, I just think what's so wild about that was the child was sitting there. I think she has a diaper on, um, if I remember correctly. 
She has a diaper on, but imagine sitting in a hot car for five to six hours. When is lunchtime? When are you supposed to be drinking water? When should you be, you know, changing your diaper? That's, I think that's just way too cruel. Um, if it was like an hour, okay, maybe, or in two hours, you know, she forgot or something and the kid didn't really need to like drink or eat. I think five to six hours is way too long. Like when, when, when was her next meal was supposed to be? When, when <laughs> it was really hot outside. Like she didn't even like go to like feed her any water, uh, sorry, feed her any water or anything like that. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. Um, I don't know. Fuck that mom. I am I don't know what the boyfriend got sentenced. What did the boyfriend get? Do you guys know? I think boyfriend got less. Um, let me see. Let's look it up actually. Rita Pang Pangolangan. Yeah, because I think on the surface when you hear about like, oh, mom leaves child in the car and you're like, 37 years. What? That's crazy. But I don't know, man. When you watch the footages from the trial, um, it's really heartbreaking. Especially when you just see them just not even checking up on the kit whatsoever. That's that's crazy. Uh, what did her boyfriend? Oh, her boyfriend meant to get the same thing, actually. She got 37 years. Oh, her boyfriend was sentenced to... Was it 32 years? Yeah, concurrently. Okay, so they got to serve their sentence concurrently, at least. Because he got 32 years for murder and then 20 years for great bodily injury to a child. Um, so I'm sorry. So yeah, 32 years. 37 years, not enough in my opinion. Um, she's she's pretty old. I think she'll Well, actually, I don't know. Because I forgot she also does math. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe she just looks a lot older than she really is. Um, I think 37. I don't know. The way that she looks, I'm just judging right now. It looks like she'll probably just die in prison. Hmm. I have to say that you are looking useful and looking like a delicious snack today. Who are you talking to? Fuck. Next week is a hearing for the asshole that killed his three boys. Which one, Chad? She looks like 50, 60. Yeah, she does. I also don't know if she just looks older. You know what's the crazy thing about that? Um, shortly after her mother was arrested, okay, shortly after she was arrested for leaving her child in the car, her daughter also, I think her daughter also got arrested like a week after for leaving her six and seven year old in the car for an hour as she went into a Walmart. <laughs> like, what the fuck are people doing? And this is a Walmart. Does Walmart have a rule that says no children allowed? I don't understand why you wouldn't bring your kids into the Walmart. You know, they have the cards like, I don't know, it's really fucking weird. The lack of urgency will be demands some jail time. It's really hard for parents to full on um, for parents with full on special needs. So I mean, close to help. Well, I don't think this was a slip up. Like I, you have to watch the trial. You got to watch the video. Um, if it was like a slip up and she just like forgot because she was busy, it was a hectic day. You know, she thought she dropped off her kids somewhere or she thought someone else was going to come and unlock the car. That's a different story. But because of the fact that she was hanging around the car arguing with her boyfriend for a couple of hours. They disappeared to go have sex for an hour and they never check on the kid for like four or five hours in a hot car. Like that's just unacceptable. Um, I believe the wind, yeah, windows were up. Car wasn't even on. That's horrible. So I totally get that if you're, if you just fucking forgot and you just messed up, but I don't know, watch the, um, watch the security cam footage. The whole thing is recorded where you can just see them just hanging around the car and in your mind, you're just desperately saying like, oh my God, please check on the child. Please check on the child. Oh my God, please open the door. Please like turn on the car, turn on the AC on, do something. But yeah, her boyfriend put the kid in the car. Yeah, they were both there. Um, so she was like walking along with her boyfriend and then he was the one that put the child in the car. I mean, I can pull up the, the footage. Uh, I mean, unless you, you've seen parts of the trial, unless you've seen the security cam footage, and then you still want to maintain that, like, oh, you know, like, I'm still going to make excuses for her. Um, I don't know. I just feel like I wouldn't be so readily to make excuses for someone who's accused of something so heinous. And then, like, if you haven't seen the video yet, like, I don't know, the video is just it's pretty fucking bad. Um, she was also on meth as well, so she tried to blame it on meth. But, I mean, as you guys know, when you get in a car and you're drunk driving, if you kill someone, you can't just be like, oh, well, I was drunk. <laughs> You got to absolve me from any type of crimes that I commit because I was drunk. 
Like you're, you're still responsible, even if you're under the influence, because you yourself put yourself under influence, you know, whether it's drugs, drinking or whatever the fuck it is. But, um, no, no worries. Kay. It's all good. here. I, I have the footage of, I think. Sorry. I, I don't know. I watched, I, I fucking watched the, the trial and it was just like, it was like fucking, it was bad. And then I think what was worse was that the mom during the sentencing, she was still in denial. She's like, it's not murder. Like, oh, so I died. It's not murder. And she was, she was like still trying to get at her, her. Like, I don't know. She was trying to get out of it. I feel like if you killed your daughter or let's say even if it's accidental, right? I don't know. <laughs> Extremely accidental. Um, but if you left your kid in the car and it was like really hot and she essentially like suffered, I feel like as a mom, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, but wouldn't it just be like, you know what? I, I fucked up so bad. Like, holy shit. Like, fuck me. Like, I don't know. She was still trying to get herself out of it. Um, I don't know. Maybe I just don't like her demeanor. Um, let me see if you can find it. Oh, Rina, Panga, Langa, Langa, Manga, Manga, Manga. Is it this one? I investigate. The trial was only like two days long. Uh, let me find it. Sorry, I'm just. So this is, yeah, they have, they have the full, like, look, this is the car right here. It's in front of the house. No shade. No shade whatsoever. I, you're hoping at some point, maybe, like, I think there's some shade provided by the trees back there or, like, the house. I think the car was just straight up just in the sun um, the entire time, if I remember correctly. So do we have the footage of where they brought the, they put the kid in? I don't know. I think they, like, oh, this part right here. Yeah, so this is like 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Her and her boyfriend come out. They put the child in the back seat. Get the child strapped in. Okay, and then... Sorry, they like fucked up their footage. They're arguing for a little bit. Again, the child's been in the car since like 11 something. Oh, and the boyfriend makes these motions of his like shirt because it's like really hot outside. So he's taking his shirt and he's like waving it around to get like airflow to his body. And so they're like arguing. They're here for a little bit. There's a doggo. Windows. Windows aren't down. Car isn't on. They're arguing. And I get it. Like, maybe, like, she was trying to leave, but then she decides to, like, try to, like, work things out with her boyfriend. And they just end up arguing even more. But not for five hours or six hours. That's just... <laughs> or four or five hours, whatever it is. So they're just sitting there. She's, like, just arguing. She's still there, arguing. We're, like, 20 minutes in. We are about in at almost two hours. So this is like 146. Wait, more than that. She was in the car at like 11, like 08, right? So this is like, like, this is, this is like almost two, and a half, two to three hours. Um, again, still arguing. This is 150. Still arguing. I think they're trying to make up. I think they were trying to like kiss. I think they're starting to make up right now. It's almost two o'clock. Okay, so they do make up. They hug it out. Again, the kid's right there. It's not like it's out of sight. Still there. I think they start arguing again. Still arguing. Still arguing. I think they're starting to make up. They make up. They kiss. They start getting really horny. He's playing with his junk. And this is when they disappear to have sex. And they're gone for like an hour. <laughs> okay, so right now it's 2 o'clock. 2.03. 2.09. 2.16. 2.20. 2 I don't know what happens here. All right, 220. I think they're, are they taking a break? 240, 
305. Uh, it's more than an hour. Okay, so at some point they emerge, like... Is it an hour-ish later? Okay, so they come out an hour later. It looks like they're fighting again. So they've been fucking for about an hour. They come out, they're still fighting. Fighting. Again, she's been in the car for four hours now. At this point, I think she realizes she's going to her car. No, oh, they're still fighting. And you guys see, there's no shade on this car. No fucking shade. <laughs> like, I think she might have tints, but come on. All right, she goes to the car. She's like, oh, it, it, I can't open it. But she's still fighting with them. Oh, I can't open it. And she's like, oh, shit. And he's like, okay, what's wrong? Again, I, I, I don't know. They're like sort of fighting and she's like maybe like trying to get in. So at this point, this is where I expect like, okay, let's smash the windows in. Let's call 911. Like, let's, let's get someone to come in and like. So this is three o'clock right now. So three o'clock, they're going to try to get in. They're going to go to their tool shed, try to get a tool to get her out. And they're sitting here. Um, I think they're trying to call someone. I don't know who they're trying to call. Apparently, they were trying to get a second key. Maybe they're calling. I'm not sure who they're calling. And then they're, si <laughs> they're sitting right here. <laughs> they're sitting on a swim chair. Like, what the? What is wrong? What, 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 and this is not just one person. This is a lapse of judgment of two people here. And look, and notice, they're not out in the sun. They're both in the shade, out of the sun, because they probably know how fucking hot it is. And they're just sitting there, trying to contact whoever. But no, man, I don't know. Get something and smash the doors in. Like, smash the windows in. So they're, they're sitting on there, doing God knows what. At this point, it's about 20 minutes after they realize they can't get in the car. 20 minutes, okay? Um, I think they're like smoking meth. I don't know when they start smoking meth or they're just smoking meth throughout the day, but apparently, um, I, I think they were on meth. But, I mean, you can see they're not, like, completely, like, oh, my God, like, zombed out. Like, they're walking around, they're arguing and stuff, and, you know, they're, like, drunk and passed out. But, like, this is, like, I don't know. They're just, they're just chilling here in the shade while she's just baking in the car. Um, she's sitting here. They're sitting here for a little bit, still in the shade. This is about 30 minutes later. Um, I don't know where they, they go. They go somewhere. Okay, so at some point, uh, 40 minutes later, they get into a different car to try to get the second key or maybe get a tool to get her out. So this is 45 minutes after they realize she's locked in the car. I don't know. Okay, they, they drive off. This is about almost 50 minutes after. So they drive off and I'm like thinking, okay, they should be back soon, right? So they drive off at 3.52. I think they were breaking. Where is it? Oh shit, did I floor too much? I think they're, are they still arguing? They drive off at 3.52. Let's see the rest. Oh, I think right here. Okay, so they've been gone for... They've been gone for like 352, it's 25. It's almost 40 minutes that they've been gone for. Now we're starting to get some shade coming in towards the car, but nowhere near the back seat where her daughter is. And yeah, they're gone for like almost an hour. They were gone for 50 minutes. They come back. I don't know what's going on. It looks like they're just talking in the car. Maybe they're like, oh shit, like should we call emergency cops? Now she's trying to get in again. Again, this is, this is, this is, this is an hour and 45 minutes after they realized the door was locked.
Yeah, it's just awful. The car, I don't know, there's like the lights are flashing. They're trying to get in. I will say, though, um, the boyfriend's defense was that he said the car was on. Um, but yeah, they the state doesn't believe it. And obviously the judge didn't believe it. It was something about how when you lock or unlock a car or something, how the lights flash, that if a car was on, a lights will flash, the light will flash a certain way or something. But um, the police try to, they try to, um, they try to reenact that and they couldn't. So that was like what they were trying. They're trying to argue that the car was on. Um, but I still think that, you know, even if we want to believe, which I don't believe the car was on, um, even if you want to believe that the car was on, um, yeah, leaving someone in the car for that long and they don't have the ability to leave, open the door, get out. Like, I don't know. I think that's just really awful. And the fact that like, it wasn't like they kept checking up on her as they were arguing. They just, they just left her there. Yeah. But you know, they got 37 years. So, and he got 32 years. So. Yeah. It, it's just so sad that, um, she had to suffer for so long. I I don't I don't see that as being a quick death. Um yeah. That's that seems like a really long really long and tortuous death. Um it's really sad. But anyways, yeah, that's like the Rita Pangalang and case that uh Judge Newman was talking about. Um you guys should um if you have time, watch the sentencing part. Watch the sentencing. Oh, by the way, this is the same guy that testified in the Murdoch trial. I mean, obviously, because, like, it's, like, the same county and stuff. But, yeah, Judge Newman oversaw this one. It was super sad. All right. Sorry, guys. I ended my stream on a sad note. Um, so, in case you guys missed it earlier uh, today, um, there was a status hearing for Alec Murdoch. His lawyer, his attorneys, did not want the trial for the financial crimes to happen this year. Harpulian um, said he was busy. Jim Jim is busy as well. And they were like, well, how are you supposed to find a jury? In such a short notice of time, where are we supposed to go? Mars? <laughs> Judge Newman is like, oh, there's other counties. Hello. Um, and then Harpulian did bring up about the potential um, impropriety of the court of clerk. I don't, I hate that word. Court of clerk um, with the jury tampering thing. So he did bring that up. That's, that's in the court transcripts for today. Um, but yeah, we'll have to wait until what happens tomorrow. But for Russell Lafitte, I don't know what happened. The audio was shit. So I just skipped it. However, for um, Corey Fleming, his sentencing was today. And the reason why his sentencing was today while the others are still pending was because he decided to plead guilty. Uh, he was one of the first, he was the first, sorry, to plead guilty on these financial crimes. Um, and I think, I think he was sentenced 20 years, like total, I think. But I don't know, we are, <laughs> I feel like our math is all over the place. I, I, I heard Judge Newman say concurrent um, for, Concurrent for the um, the charges for like Satterfield and for um, the other victim. And then I heard consecutive when, you know, you do those two together. So I don't know. But anyways, um, yeah, that's where we are. That's where we are. Wouldn't lights be on if it was, oh, yeah, like the headlights. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I don't know. Someone was recently sentenced for murder for having killed someone during an illegal car race. Racing gets worse in the last decade. I heard about it. You're from Belgium. Do trashy would doing trash things. I read that already. All right, what does the poll say? The poll says five to 15 years. We have 11% that says less than five years. Really? You guys thought it was going to less than five years? 
less than five years, uh, five to 15 years, 15 to 25 years, and then the 18% with 25 plus plus. So five to 15 years. A lot of you guys thought it was going to be five to 15. And I think it's 20. <laughs> we'll wait until the legal experts jump in and uh, they'll do the mathing for us and they'll let us know. But uh, yeah, for tomorrow, uh, we'll see what happens with the, you know, potential Alex Murdoch getting a, um, you know, maybe a new trial. We'll see. And then there's been some stuff with Koberger's and cameras in court from, um, I don't know what happened, but I, all I know so far is I think the defense and the state both agree that they don't want cameras to be in courtroom. However, um, two of the victim's family members have spoken out um, and they want cameras to be in the courtroom. And I know obviously the media does as well. So um, yeah, I don't know. I think they did a hearing today, but I don't know if they made the decision. We'll see what happens with that. And um, I know that there's supposed to be a hearing, I think like a bond hearing for Jody Frankie, sorry, Jody Frankie, for Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt. Um, I'm not really quite sure when that's going to happen because I know one of the attorneys had a vacation plan. So I don't know if that's going to get pushed or anything like that. We'll see. We'll see what happens with that. You got 20. Yes, I was right. All right, guys, you guys have to give me a cookie. I was right. Um, yeah, I think 20. 20 is okay. Yeah. 20 and then the seven years for the federal one. Debunked the defense cameras. Wait, what? <laughs> Was there anything else? Um, oh, I did want to watch something, but I don't know. Oh, man, it's almost 2 o'clock. I didn't think this was going to be this long. Um, I added... Oh, what was this? We were lied to. Director calls out Netflix. Making a murderer over planted evidence claim. Ooh, what is this? Let's watch this really quick. This with the not... Murdoch stuff. All right, I'm going to use the restroom really quick, so... In a second, I'll be back in two What about senior citizens? <laughs> okay. I want to watch this really quick. Um, director calls out Netflix making a murderer over planted evidence claims. This is for the Alex Murdoch. What is this? Hold on. Is this something else? Wait, why did it have... I thought it had Alex Murdoch on the... Um, Oh, it's a Daily Wire docu-series. Never mind. I thought it was... Oh, never mind. I don't want to watch this. I'll watch this in my own time. I thought it had Alex Murdoch on the thumbnail. <laughs> well, oh, I think I just thought the guy looked like Alex Murdoch. Oh my god, it's not him. <laughs> okay, to be fair, I was very tired this morning. And lack of sleep. Uh, I was listening to Mormon stories last night. So I went to sleep very, 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 very late. Um, but speaking of which, have you guys um, listened to the podcast? A lot of the viewers here were, uh, a lot of the viewers here were recommending it to me. So I'll listen to it. Um, that was very, very good. <laughs> he 
was not on my mind, okay? This this orange jumpsuit, blonde head guy just looked like him for a second. I was, I, was, I think I was just really tired. I was just super tired. Uh, was there anything else that I wanted to watch with you guys? I think that's it. That's it. Yep, yep. All right, guys. If I don't see you guys, um, if I don't see you guys, hope I hope you guys have a good weekend. Although I have a feeling I might pop in tomorrow. Uh, we'll see what happens. You know, maybe Carpootlian and maybe Jim Jim will do another press conference or something. But we'll see about that one. Um, but if I don't see you guys this weekend, I hope you guys have a good one. I hope you guys take care. Um, I don't think I'm going to chop up this live stream into a YouTube video. I think I'm just going to have the whole thing in its entirety. Unless I do like a recap. Maybe I'll do like a recap video of like what happened in today's hearing. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But other than that, um, thanks for hanging around. Thanks for being here. Thanks for lurking in the chat. Uh, thanks for actively talking in the chat as well. I do appreciate you guys. Uh, thank you for the memberships and all the uh, the likes on the video and stuff like that. And yeah, I hope you guys have a good weekend. I'm going to probably go stream on Twitch later. I play video games on there. If you guys want to do video game stuff, feel free to stop by, say hi. But other than that, um, you know, for all the true crime related content will be on here. And I, I got to start working on doing the vlog stuff again because I do want to record you know, the stuff and then like be able to watch it back when I'm older or like if one of my dogs passes away again, you know, so I definitely wanted to work more on the vlog stuff, but um, I hope you guys have a good one. Take care. Yeah. Bye, Kay. Thank you. I really enjoy your content. Yeah. Thanks for chatting. I appreciate you. Um, you guys have a great weekend, but I think I might see you guys tomorrow. I have a feeling. We'll see. All right, y'all have a good one. Bye. Oh, the transcript reads. You know, there is this really long, 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 long transcript um, of it was like Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. It was in the um, unsealed, unsealed court docs, um, but it's very, very long. Um, I thought about reading it when it first came out like a year ago, but I don't know. We'll see. It's like super, super long. Maybe I'll take a look into it. Um, it's like maybe like 100 pages long we'll see <laughs> but yeah i was um that was really interesting i don't think anyone made a youtube video about it or covered it or anything like that mm. you say i appreciate you and i hear the umbrella guy maybe that's where i'm getting it from i i appreciate we i appreciate no we couldn't do it without you is that what he says we couldn't do this without you i don't know oh did you guys see the um the amber heard cosplay um umbrella guy did a video about um i think there's like a biography out of elon musk and i pay i i paused the video so i can read some of the excerpts on there and what caught my attention was elon was like oh overwatch is my favorite game because that's a game that i usually play uh with my sister like oh overwatch is my favorite game and like you got amber heard to cosplay as mercy and i was like oh gosh and then uh, that was actually tweeted out <laughs> it was <laughs> It was Amber Heard in a Mercy cosplay. But yeah. Anyways, yeah. Have a good weekend, though. I think I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good one. And uh, go outside. Get some fresh air. I think my rose garden is actually doing good. We ha we're getting some roses that are blooming. So I think I'm starting to figure out what's going on in my garden. I think I was just underwatering it or something. I don't know. And I had to change the mulch, too, because um, when we were getting a lot of rain, it was like it was like a lot of mushrooms popping up. I don't know. Anyway, sorry, this is just rambling. <laughs> Bye, guys. Have a good one. Take care. And